Well, one study I read was talking about most of the people who are struggling with their gender identity, if left to their own devices, would just turn out to be gay and would accept the that fact that they're is, gay. Uh, the, I, as the fact checker here, I don't, I'm going to look that up. Okay. Yes. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Jess Marshall Podcast. This week, for the third time, my first ever three-peat guest on the Jess Marshall Podcast, the one and only Rich Warfield. We're going to break it all down. Wondering what's going on with Ukraine and Russia, Israel, Palestine, immigration, Trump. Boom. Rich is in the house. Let's throw it down. I hope you enjoy. Talk to you after. Well, it depends. Each judge runs their own courtroom. Right. And so in Dallas especially, um, there are still some who are nervous. They s still have signs up on the doors uh, about wearing a mask. And they don't, they're don't. they generally not enforcing it, but they've got glass partitions at the, at the you know, judge's bench. And I heard, too, that, and I don't really know much about uh, Dallas, how Dallas and Collin County are doing things, but Denton County's had a work release for nonviolent offender, a work release program. They canceled that when COVID started, and it sounds like they never picked it back up. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm yeah. Not, I, I haven't had that situation. All up. kinds of issues, though, just in jails, prisons, et cetera, with short staffing and overcrowding and all those types of things still. Oh, it disrupted everything. Yeah. I mean, they're still backlogged on cases. Wow. Uh, things that got kind of kick down the kick the can down the road yeah um, now things are starting to get back to normal i've noticed and the courthouses are full yeah parking lots are full uh, business is good yeah, well yeah it's picking back up yeah the business of uh yeah that of, war on drugs it's like well, the gift that just keeps on giving let's take people down <laughs> man let's fill these private prisons man. That's right. let's get the cash rolling in the war on drugs is uh fascinating right that's a nancy that was a nancy reagan concoction or at Just least she no. ran point yeah at the beginning yeah. right yeah that was the, well the war on drugs goes back to the 1920s or 30s um it, it, nixon stepped it up reagan stepped it up um, and it's all been a failure, just like trying to stop prostitution has never been successful. Don't you think the the war on drugs, though, is a lot like the the Patriot Act, right? It just gives them more broad Ab sweeping. Absolutely. You remember when Judge Napolitano went on his rant and lost his show off of Fox? Yes. Uh, that was one of the questions or the points he made is, what if the war on drugs is really just a jobs program for law enforcement oh, and, no for, way. and to fill the prisons and to concentrate more power? Right. Uh, in the hands of the government. And, of course, there's a lot of evidence that that's exactly what it is. You know, people a lot of times when they talk about, if I talk to people about how crazy I think the prison and, and law and just law enforcement, just, that, just all of it is. You know, I've had people on the podcast like Greg Kelly put in jail for five years for aggravated sexual assault he didn't commit. He was It was finally found that there was corruption at high levels with his defense attorney working with the DA. He got out. He got a settlement from Texas. Just craziness, right? Yeah. And you have people, high-profile people like Kim Kardashian pushing for prison reform, getting people who are on death row, exonerated, um, the Innocence Project, et cetera, et cetera. When you talk to people about how many humans we imprison in this country and the bulk of those are nonviolent or start as nonviolent drug offenses is there a way to fix this or it's just another llc and it's so ingrained and when people like even trump talk about the rule of law right and he's up there he's preaching like a televangelist about the rule of law to get all the right yeah yeah I mean, you're talking about people who've been in prison for 20, 30 years because they got a little too much pot on them. Well, that's changing. Um, we have kind of shifted already because, you know, we, we call ourselves the land of the free, but we have the world's highest incarceration rate. And back when Ann Richards uh, was governor uh, and the federal government came up with their federal sentencing guidelines, um, you know, crack cocaine was a big problem. They built all these new prisons— uh, and then all of a sudden the crime rate, violent crime rate plummeted and it was basically because of Roe versus Wade had kicked in and that pool of uh, violent criminals diminished. Uh, in other words, it took 14, 15 years sure. for the effect to be felt. 
And a lot of those babies were aborted that would have become gang members or that's thugs or uh, their stat their stats that back all that up. Yes. And about the same time, also, they did start to figure out that it's really expensive to incarcerate people and that uh, most of those drug offenders were there for possession, a nonviolent possession of a small amount. And that's when they came up yeah, with not the state trafficking or distribution. Right. You get caught with a grammar lesson. So they came up with it was a really bad idea. They, they made it what's called a state jail felony. Uh, rather than reducing it to a misdemeanor, by making it a state jail felony with a different set of rules, they built a whole new slew of prisons, which meant a lot of money to contractors. Um, and um, then they were empty when they first built them. And so they started renting out the space to prisoners from other states. And as they gradually became filled, then they stopped taking prisoners from other states. But, uh, but a, a state jail felony, uh, you, they have to give you probation. Okay. You can get up to five years probation for it. Um, that's possession of a gram or less of cocaine, heroin, or uh, or uh, cocaine, heroin, or uh, like methamphetamine. Meth- yeah. yeah. So what what they did is they have gradually shifted from mass incarceration to mass probation. Yeah. Diversion programs, supervision, but even so, that means there's still an enormous role for government to play. You know, you have to supervise these people, probation officers, uh, people teach them, they go through these programs. Um, it would be, che- I think, cheaper if they just got out of the drug war business altogether and had public service ads saying, look, do you, are you tired of drugs uh, impacting your life negatively? You know, enroll in this program and spend that money instead on health care or uh, voluntary programs that people could... Most rehab. people don't want to be addicted to any of that. No, rehab, counseling. That's right. Other possibly um, alternative methods of recovery as well, as you see things like uh, psychedelics coming back into, you know, just the general consciousness as a solution for many things. That's PTSD, right. addiction, depression, anxiety, etc. That's right. The psilocybin mushrooms, there's yeah. some really promising research. Ketamine that- as well, ibogaine as well, all all these things that can help really help yes. people that were outlawed in the 60s by the government they, after. Not only was it outlawed, but then they weren't studied properly. Right. So now so you've you got get guys some... like Terrence and uh, Dennis McKenna who are doing all this research and the guys who are doing research on MDMA, you know, Molly, ecstasy, yes. the party drug, yep. um, which is how it was, vil- you know, vilified that drug. They brought it on Oprah, right? And they showed a brain that had that had been exposed to MDMA and it had holes in it. Only to then talk to the guy who went on Oprah, who was there to talk about his MDMA studies, and all these photos and the presentation was completely staged. Well, now you're sort of seeing the same thing with fentanyl. Yeah. And it's hard to know what's true and what's not true. But there's a lot of hype with fentanyl about how deadly it is. And, and like you mentioned, that it, drug dogs can't even sniff it because it could kill them. Um, and I don't know because I'm, like I said, I'm not an expert on the fentanyl, but the fentanyl scare reminds me a lot of the crack, uh, scare. Well, the crack scare, crack cocaine was introduced into the inner city and it was intentional. It was, it was by the American intelligence community. Yes. Paying for the, taking their profits and funding black operations. Right. Black ops. Yeah. So crack cocaine never existed, then it existed and became pervasive and mostly in the African-American communities, which is where it was introduced. That's right, and then it burned itself out because people saw, people who you know have free will, saw how bad it was. Uh, and I remember seeing an interview with one guy and he saw, I saw what it did to my auntie. You know, I wasn't going anywhere near that stuff. And a lot of people made that choice. People saw how bad it was, they tried to stay away from it. But interestingly, they made by the war on drugs made cocaine itself so expensive. You know, it used to be like a hundred dollars a gram or more. Um, people didn't have that money, but you could, uh, I guess, filter it down to crack and go out and buy a hit for five dollars or ten dollars. Yeah, what? Crack and so is... that they created the market that made it attractive to get a smaller yeah. uh, amount, which was even worse. With well, with and crack. by. Uh... By making that supply uh, so attractive and by the demands never going anywhere. That's right. Then the, then the suppliers are able to charge more and make more. And when they do, they become more powerful. Can you talk a little bit about how you see 
those government agencies and how they work with the cartel, right? There's lots of movies about it, writing about it. There's studies about it. There's, uh, there's people who say, I've seen memos about it. I know this was on purpose, etc. But we've got this war on drugs. We got all these people in jail. What's the harm in de just decriminalizing it everywhere? Well, uh, you know, there's some downside to that, too. They tried that in Zurich, Switzerland, Needle Park. They've tried that Oregon, Boston's combat zone. Different places have tried. Um, and the problem with doing it piecemeal like that is you attract all the worst people to that place because they think they have basically a sanctuary uh, city or a sanctuary area of the city. So it creates attendant crime. Uh, around there. So if you did it, it would have to be, uh, think of like if Colorado did it, would you get every, you know, low life or every junkie, every addict in the country descending on Colorado? It wouldn't be good for Colorado. But if the entire country did it, then there would be no incentive to go anywhere other than where you already are for, you know, that's where you grew up, that's where your family is. And then you could work on, uh, you know, public policy for, uh, for health care uh, and uh, trying to get these people the help they need. You know, during COVID, we saw a lot of different states respond to the cold differently. Texas responded much differently than bluer states, right? That's right. Um, Florida. The, Florida kind of adopted the Swedish method. Yeah. The, um, the, the states' rights piece of this whole drug, war on drugs thing and immigration and COVID, etc. You know, states have rights. You know, the feds are dialed in on texas right now for putting barbed wire up on the on the border that's right and texas is saying you know you're not going to do anything about it we are especially texans who live there who've got criminals just pouring over probably some good people pouring over too sure. but they're not doing it the right way what do we do there just open the borders and let them in what's it six million have come over the borders that's documented i've that's seen i've seen estimates as high as 22 million since biden took office um, yeah and uh you know, there's an interesting, I think it's episode 71 with uh, Tucker Carlson and Brett Weinstein, who's a biologist who he interviewed at length about the COVID scam. And yep. uh, But he, he, Brett Weinstein, went down to uh, Central America to get a handle on this, to see where everybody's coming in. And it was interesting because he said uh, that these people are coming from all over the world. They're coming into Ecuador because they don't require a visa to come into Ecuador, and then they get on the Pan American Highway, and they come north until they get to this area, I think it's Colombia, called the Darien Gap, and that's unpaved. That's the one gap in the Pan American Highway that goes from Alaska all the way down to Patagonia, and um, and that these people, it's very dangerous to go through the jungle there, and some people perish. Um, but he said it's a, basically his conclusion was it's a combination of invasion and immigration. So you've got the people who are coming for the same reason they've always come to have a better life. And then you've got the folks who are coming from from Asia and Africa all over uh, the world to try to get in. And there are a lot of military age people. And he said he didn't see with the Asians. He didn't see any children with them like you would see with the South Americans. So the fear is that they're sending sleeper cells over or maybe, you know, military folks to attack us from within. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's definitely something to worry about. You know, Abbott's a politician like all politicians. You know, there it's the WWE with ties on. Sure. That's all politicians are. Pro wrestlers. They're all drinking at the same bar after sure. the show. Follow you know? the money. It's all right. about the money and power. Is Abbott Has Abbott done too little too late? You know, uh, he sits around. Like then he takes action and likes to grandstand, like sending buses or airplanes of folks up to the sanctuary cities in the Which northeast. Which was brilliant. Oh I think. yeah, that was, that was great about PR as move. gangster as yes, it gets. Yes, and like yo, you know, oh okay, New York. He's like, kind of like Christy Noem. You're tired. Yes, she's. Uh, I mean, awesome too. If you're going to be, yes. I mean, Abbott, Christy Noem, they're they're, they're excellent. But I give uh, DeSantis the, the most credit because he didn't wait to see if the coast was clear. He did what was right from the get go. He had the courage to, to be the one first to act. Um, Abbott's a little timid. Yes, yes. And, and, and that's another, that's a human trait. That's a pol politician's trait. Uh, you don't want to get too far see. ahead of right. everybody. Um, and, uh, you know, so uh, that's a minor criticism. Like I, I would level at Christy Noem as well. Um, but I think 
some people wait for other people to provide cover, and when people start, you know, bitching loudly enough about it, then they realize it's okay to join it or to, to even lead it at that point. So hopefully we're getting to that point now with our cancel culture and, and people getting sick of uh, heavy-handed government that people are standing up and saying, enough. What do you do if you're a private cis- citizen and you live in Eagle Pass or Alpine and the back of your ranch is just a thoroughfare for people pouring over? What do you do? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know what those people do. They got um, trail cameras up everywhere. They can see there's, they'll come across dead bodies. You know, when you get out there toward Big Bend in the middle, at overnight, it, it gets cold. Those people get oh, die sure. of exposure, dehydration, et cetera. Yeah, it, it, it's very dangerous. And, of course, Biden's not doing those people any favors by encouraging them, by, you know, flashing the green light where they come over, then they end up drowning in the Rio Grande or they die in the desert. Um, you know, they talk about compassion. That's not compassionate. You're basically leading these people on and setting themselves up for failure or even death. When uh, this country was settled, and uh, especially up the gut, you know, uh, part of um, Manifest Destiny, and you had all of these Europeans coming over, right? They got their free land. They just had to go in and settle it, which was just us going, well, we got a whole bunch of land. And there are some wild ass Indians out here and they just keep handing us our lunch every time we go out there. Let's bring cannon fodder in these Europeans. I mean, there were just advertisements in the newspaper and like the Romanian times. Come on over. We got some donkeys. You can get you can have a ranch and here's a gun. What do I need a gun for? Oh, you never heard of the Comanches? You just wait. You don't know who Navarro is? Prepare. But when they're making landfall down there in Corpus Christi. Right. And they're 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 saying, OK, land of the free, home of the brave. Here I am. Land of opportunity. I mean, this country was settled by people who had no idea what they were walking into. Right. That's right. And just I mean, it I, got settled, if you want to say that, but in a very violent manner. I was in Taos, New Mexico, three weeks ago. And I went to Kit Carson's house, which awesome. is now a museum. And I bought his autobiography and I'm reading it right now. It's a quick read, but it's just hard to wrap one's mind around how brutal the existence was and how tough these people were. Uh, I mean, killing, you know, Indians or being killed by Indians was basically a a regular occurrence. Um, And uh, these people, it's just amazing that that it even got settled. Uh, When we're talking about, you know, back then people are immigrating here for opportunity. Now we've got immigration and this i mean the statue of liberty welcomes immigrants right that's what this yes. country was built on yes my we needed ancestors people back then. yes we need because we were empty right australia has done it more recently canada but basically what's happened is we were empty we wanted people uh and now we're not so empty we're not so empty and if you look at the other superpowers and their demography say russia and china right widely held as the two other superpowers. China's demography is declining rapidly, and their average age is increasing rapidly. Their one-child rule has now come back to haunt them. Their average And India has more people than China does now. Uh, China is losing Chinese nationals. A lot of Chinese nationals coming over the border right now. Yes. So as those superpowers lose people and we gain people there people would say listen this immigration thing isn't as bad as all these politicians on either side want to make it seem or not because you cannot dominate if you don't have a growing population and our population grows not because um american citizens are procreating at a a greater rate than ever but because of our Immigra- our loose immigration Well, laws. the demographics are changing, and, and what they call white Russians are not procreating, and that's been going on for 50 years. They've been worried about that. Um, and uh, I think the Chinese are, 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 are if they haven't already, they're going to repeal their law about w- only having one child. I think they already have, but it's too late. Like, if they went to war right now, like I'm talking man on man, which if you went... If you had a global war right now, it would not necessarily be well, meeting well, on the battlefield. Well, the problem with global, I mean, with uh, infantry is you have to have proximity. Yeah. So no, uh, that's you know nobody can get to the United States with their troops. You yeah. can send missiles in and cause damage, but you can't then follow up with an occupation unless you can get mm-hmm. uh, a lot of soldiers. 
Um, but there's speculation that what the Chinese are doing is sending in these sleeper cells so they can start creating havoc within the United States, which when combined with all the other things like supply chain disruptions, um, uh, you know, defund the police uh, and all the other problems, you know, increased crime looks like we're coming apart at the seams. Um, that may be this uh, uh, this asymmetric warfare, basically. Are things more chaotic globally right now than you ever remember? Or is that an optical illusion just because we get so much real-time information so yeah, fast? It's, it's hard to days. say because, you know, at my age, I remember the 60s and the student counterculture movement when they were rioting in college campuses everywhere, and they were rioting in Europe, too. Um, you know, the anti-Vietnam era. Um, and uh, people thought, you know, the worst was going to happen. But I, I think things may be worse now because American, Americans have been so dumbed down. Uh, you know, we don't have civics uh, classes at an early enough age to teach uh, American students the importance of our founding documents, why they exist, why the founders had the philosophy they did, how you shouldn't trust a centralized, strong government, um, and all the pitfalls that that entails. So uh, it's, it, I think we've lost a generation or two. And the question remains whether we'll ever get it back. You still, I mean, look, they're using the same playbook to try to get everybody afraid uh, of Ukraine and Russia. And we got to do this. We got to go fight again, even though none of these countries threaten us directly. None of them. Um, nobody can even get here. Oh, my God, if you put troops on a, on a big naval boat and launched it, we would see it on our satellites. And you could just drop a bomb on it and sink the whole thing yeah. immediately. You so, so it's really not anything to be worried about but fear fear sells it's really useful oh. to manipulate people with fear yeah i mean we've seen that in the last four years more than anything what were you saying uh i had heard you say something rich about like obviously we uh put bases everywhere around the world but imagine if china put a base in the u.s like that's what you're getting that right. Th that's right. That's right. We we th we've basically Pat Buchanan wrote a book called A Republic, Not an Empire, and his point was we have allowed ourselves to morph into an empire. We've got more than 800 bases or military inst installations all over the planet, and we're trying to basically force our will on every other country. And if they don't like it. Uh, we try to bribe them by giving them foreign aid. If that doesn't work, we do regime change. And I think there's been something like 80 regime changes since World War II. That's not what the founders intended for this country's foreign policy to look like. I think it was Jefferson, they say, you know, honest trade and friendship with all nations and tangling alliances with none. Or George Washington in his farewell speech, I mentioned this before when I was here, uh, he called it passionate attachments. We need to avoid passionate attachments with other countries because if we don't, their enemies will become our enemies. Let's mind our own business. And, of course, Ron Paul has been all about that from the beginning. The great Ron uh, Paul. Yes, yes, the great Ron Paul. And, of course, to a, a little bit lesser extent, his son Rand um, and Tom, Tom Massey, a congressman from Kentucky. Um, and there are those. And that, that, that idea is growing. Um, but here we see the, the mainstream media that's corrupt, uh, thoroughly corrupt, they're freaking out because, and they're trying to get everybody uh, on board with, we need to attack Iran. They don't mention any event that happens, any bomb that goes off in the Middle East without prefacing it with an Iran-backed yeah. uh, group. Right. And, and it's because they are very clearly trying to demonize Iran. Why? The world's biggest terrorist sponsor. Actually, no, we're the world's biggest terrorist sponsor. We supply something like 70% or more of the world's military hardware and weapons. Uh, uh, you know, it was the great Smedley Butler, who was two-time Medal of Honor winner, Marine Corps Commandant, who said war is a racket. It's a famous 1920s speech that he made. You know, people should go look it up. War is a racket. And he talked about making uh, Hawaii safe for dull pineapple people. And he's fought here, there, and everywhere else. And, and it basically, it's all it is. He's a hired thug. Yeah. And it's not, it has not changed. You know, it's, it's a very big difference between people grabbing their gun over the fireplace and meeting in the town square to defend their their homes and their communities with their with their neighbors when you get invaded but we haven't been invaded since eight, what 1812 uh, the War of 1812 which was another dumb war by the way the, that's where the term hawk comes from really yeah the term hawk comes from 1812 and we had a bunch of young John McCain types in Congress that wanted to go out and, and show the, the the British Empire that we could kick their butt and uh, and so, um, 
we got the war we wanted. They came into Washington. They burned down the White House, yeah. and everybody f- fled Washington. And of course, then that's when you know Francis Scott Key writes uh, his uh, Star Spangled Banner yeah. from a prisoner ship uh, on the river, uh, Fort Sumter, outside of Baltimore. Yeah. The military industrial complex is what drives the economy at its core. That's right. That's still so, our biggest export. If we're not necessarily deploying humans, but we're deploying millions and billions uh, into arms that we didn't we we over armed Ukraine by, I believe, 500 million. And then we said, you know what, just keep that, but set it to the side. Right. Like, just put that in your in your credits and debits columns to keep it. You're probably going to need it, but don't give it back to us. The military industrial complex uh, and everybody attached to it's got to be more happy than they've ever been that Trump's not not in office because oh, yeah. we're all over the place giving money to everybody there. Yes. Yes. They're spending they're wasting so much money. And, you know, I mean, there's been reports that Zelensky has bought, you know, a eight million dollar house for his parents in yeah. Israel that that uh, he's bought a yacht. And uh, and of course, you always hear about how corrupt Ukraine is. Well, it is. And it's because it's a money laundering capital for like the uh, worldwide Jewish mafia, basically. Um, then, and, and they are as active in underworld or organized crime as the Italians are. But they're smart enough to keep their names off it. You know, Zelensky, Zelensky, of course, is Jewish. And his biggest backer is the billionaire oilman, uh, Igor Kolomoisky, who is actually an Israeli citizen. And he was the one who was employing Hunter Biden. Uh, and paying him fifty thousand dollars a month through or whatever. Burisma, yeah, through but yeah, he was the owner of Burisma, and I think I don't know if they've had a falling out or if that's just show, uh, but I think Zelensky just canceled their upcoming elections. So so much for Ukraine being a, a democracy. They were a democracy when we overthrew uh, uh, in 2014 when Obama was in the White House, and he sent Victoria Newland over there. Uh, she was the one who was handing out chocolate chip cookies or donuts in my dining square. Yes. And uh, they overthrew their democratically elected prime minister. What a humanitarian. Yes, yes. And, of course, her husband is Robert Kagan. And Robert Kagan is one of the leading uh, intellectual neocons whose partner is Bill Kristol. And the two of them are the ones who created the project for a new, a new American century, uh, which in 1998, which basically called for seven regime changes in seven years. Uh, and they were the ones who pushed hardest on invading Iraq under W. Um, so they're, they're basically PNAC. Everybody who wants to understand foreign policy should go look up PNAC, Project for a New American Century. And what happened was they, they commissioned this study under Bill, Bill Crystal um, and, and Robert Kagan. And they concluded, according to this report, that in order for there to be another century where America is number one, just like the British uh, century was the 1800s and the American century was the 1900s, if we want to replicate that, we need to be willing to use our military. Uh, we need to have a powerful military and utilize it all over the planet. And, of course, that was supposed to, everybody was just supposed to go along with that. And, uh, and uh, well, it I think it was Kenneth Edelman who said uh, it should be a cakewalk going into Iraq. And, of course, it turns out it was anything but a cakewalk. It's been one disaster after another. A whole lot of money has been spent, but it was a big waste in Afghanistan. It was a big waste in Iraq. Um, And uh, if we go after Iran, it'll be a waste there, too, with enormous costs. Um, Nobody learned anything from uh, the Soviets. And That's their right. experience in Afghanistan. Alexander the Great, the British Empire, the Soviets. They've all been rebuffed. failed. They've all been uh, a failure in Afghanistan. Most of that has to do with the terrain. As simple as that sounds, it is literally untraversable yeah, in I, an efficient way. I don't know that much about it, but I do know that it's very primitive and they've yeah. got different groups. Uh, tri- it's very tribal. It's a completely different society than that we're, what we're used well, to. Well, I mean, the U.S. can just arm a bunch of, you know, Saudis to uh, go, you know, fight the Soviets up in Afghanistan. That I think that turned out pretty good. The Mujahideen. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we, we armed the Mujahideen, the Mujahideen. And then they got, you know, they were nationalists. And then they once they got the uh, Soviets out of there, they turned on the United States. And said, now you got to get out of here, too. Um that was uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski under Carter. That was his 
scheme was to give the Soviet Union their own Vietnam experience that would wear them down, and it worked. Yeah, it basically hastened the demise of the Soviet Union. Wow, that's um, that's playing chess while everybody's playing well, checkers, and, and, isn't and it? that's what's happening again. The neocons. That's what Bill Crystal and the Robert Kagans and the Victoria Newlands are trying to do by using Ukraine. They think they're going to cause a regime change in Russia. They think they're going to take down Putin by by getting him, drawing him into Ukraine. And that's exactly what's happened. And that's the cynics say, you know, we're willing to fight to the last Ukrainian. You know, guys like Colonel Robert McGregor, uh, you know, real, real military, John Mearsheimer, the professor at the University of Chicago, real experts are like, no, 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 Putin's going to win this. It's right on his border. He's got plenty of motivation to do it, and he's in it for the long haul. All we're doing is getting a bunch of Ukrainians killed and destroying their country. And uh, and and the and the Bill Crystals and lining uh, pockets in the process. That's right, and 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 filtering off all kinds of money, uh, and that the end result is going to be Ukraine's going to lose, going to be a lot of dead people, and a lot of money's going to be made, as is always the case in war, and Putin's going to win. And of course, he's pop as popular as ever in Russia right now. The ruble is strong, um, and uh, interestingly, as side note, I I saw something on my feed that. Uh, Tucker Carlson may be airing yeah. his Putin interview tonight, five o'clock yep. Central Time. He already shot it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, when you compare the way Biden has handled uh, uh, just his international relationships, especially with Putin, to the way Trump uh, treated and related to Putin, and the way Trump treated and related to the North Koreans. What do you see? What what stands out the most? There's obviously two very separate approaches there. Yeah, they have two in completely different styles. First of all, I don't think Biden's in charge of anything. I think he's just a front man, and he does as the you know the committee, uh, whoever's really in control, uh, he does as he's told to do. Um, and the committee obviously wants chaos, um, or they wouldn't be doing things the way they are doing it. With Trump, Trump was a little bit like Reagan. Um, you want an unknown, okay? If we if we want to engage China, one of the things that you would have to consider is, oh my God, they got nuclear weapons. You know, what if they use that? Well, it's the same thing when you deal with somebody like a Reagan or a Trump. You're like, hey, is this guy a little bit crazy? He seems like he's a hard ass. Uh, you know, is he gonna you know step this up and come after us if we do this? So a lot of times people will wait, especially if they're playing the long game. Um, like the Chinese do. Um, well, gee, he's only there for four years, eight at the most. Let's just sort of like put this on the back burner and wait and see what happens. Um, and Trump um, can cut through the crap, and, and, and he did. He did with the North Korean uh, leader, um, and they didn't. Uh, other countries didn't try anything uh, overly aggressive like China going after Taiwan um, because they were – uncertain as to what our reaction would be. And in, incidentally, that's a, a common foreign policy tactic. You don't ever completely show your hand. Um, you know, when you see the term, all options are on the table, uh, or we're not ruling out this or that, that's standard procedure, whether you're Republican or Democrat. That's just wise. You don't want to overplay your hand and, dic and, and show them what you're thinking of doing. That makes sense. You talked about George Washington saying we need to avoid passionate attachments. The, the attachment that we have to Israel and what's going on in Israel right now, is that a passionate attachment? That is attachment? the mother of all passionate Why? attachments. I don't understand when, it. When, when Washington wrote what he wrote, it was about France right. because they had helped us win the revolution. There was a lot of sentiment Israel wasn't even on that the was radar. for, for yeah. France. Of course, they, then they had the French Revolution, and so there was a lot of sentiment here that we need to help them. They helped us. Uh, and that's when he said, hey, this mind our own business, you know, otherwise, you know, it will complicate things. Anyway, so, yeah, what's, what's happened is, um, is we have a large Jewish population in the United States. They are uh, about six million, uh, which may be a little bit more here than it even exists now in Israel. So, Hill, what's the percentage in the United States of our, of our uh, 3%. population? Three? Three percent. Yeah, like, Three percent is Jewish? Okay. Yes. yes. It, and I while not... Lower. Yeah, while not all Jews are Zionists, a significant portion of them are. What's what is a Zionist? A Zionist is one who believes that they have that that Jews have a right to their biblical homeland in Palestine, and actually Eretz Israel, which many are committed, like the settler movement, are committed to recreating. They want to recreate biblical Israel, and it's in Genesis fifteen eighteen. 
um, where there's a covenant between Abraham and God, and God gives to Abraham all the land between the Nile River and the Euphrates River. And that's what the real hardcore folks... Abraham, who almost killed his son, according to the Bible, right? Well, I, you know what? I'm ignorant at most of what's in the Bible. I haven't studied it. 15, 18, I think a lot of people too. are, aren't yes, they? sure. But... Not you. But they hold on to these ter- to these territorial statements made in yes. a book that was written... Yes. ...in a story, in an allegory, most likely. I had a conversation with a Jewish lawyer, a friend of mine, at the courthouse one time, and we were talking about the two-state solution and how... You know, Israel would give up Gaza, the West Bank, uh, Sinai, go on. And and he looked at me in all seriousness and said, Rich, you don't understand. We can't give that land up. God gave it to us. And at that point, of course, our conversation was over. I mean, how do you argue with that? I struggle greatly with the chosen people, God's chosen people. God gave you a piece of dirt, just personally. I'm just like, uh, let's settle it down. We're killing people over something that got written on a page yes. however long ago. Um, can if can, the, have, Are y'all... I, finish your thought, Jess. Well, if they uh, believe that that's theirs and they're not going to bend then what we've seen for my entire lifetime is just going to continue for my children's entire lifetime. Just unrest. That's exactly right. And uh, what, we've got uh, Hezbollah in the south, Hamas in the north, or vice versa. I'm no pro at this. I'm just a redneck. Hezbollah is Lebanon. Hamas is on on Gaza. And they're both involved. So One's getting all the blame right now, but they're both involved. Well, they're, they're, they're all Arab. Okay, and so they have a kinship, and so the man in the street is acutely aware that the United States has been backing Israel for generations now and wreaking havoc in their community. But the man in the street doesn't matter to either side and is dying right now because one side says we're not giving this up and the other side says it's ours, right? Well, they're willing to die for their belief. Why do they believe Gaza's theirs? That's the uh, that's the well, what's well, the flip well, side well, of the coin? Why does who believe? Why do why does the why do the why does the Arab community believe that they shouldn't have well, because to they, because they because they've there, been there? Yes, that's their native well, land. They've right. been I'm there going, for thousands of years. So Hill, I'm taking it back. I'm giving a history lesson. Okay. Why are we where okay. we are now? Here, here, and are we ever gonna fucking solve this here, here's shit? Here's a brief history, okay? The Romans, remember, they turned the Mediterranean into a Roman lake. They conquered the entire periphery of the Mediterranean, including Palestine. And the Romans were considered geniuses because when they would conquer a kingdom, they would then incorporate it into the Roman Empire. And that meant they got, like the British, you know, with their common law, the the Roman law would apply. They had safe borders and the people could prosper now as a part of Rome. The one fly in the ointment they had, of course, was uh, the problem they had with the uh, Israelites. Okay, they decided, hey, we are not going to live by your rules. We're going to do it our way. And we don't care what you say. So the Romans had trouble subjugating them and they fought a series of wars with them. And finally, finally, the diaspora is what was the result of it, the Jewish diaspora from 79 A.D. to I think 139 A.D. The Romans fought, I mean, just devastating wars. They lost a lot of people and killed a whole lot of Israelis. And, but the end result was they kicked them out. They exiled them. They said, that's it. You know, you're out of here. Get out. And they did. They left. And so those are the, the Russian Jews, the Ukrainian Jews, the Polish Jews, the uh, Sephardic Jews in, in, in the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal. They were the descendants of the, the folks who were kicked out of Palestine. So basically for two th- almost 2,000 years, there were no Jews in Palestine. There were some pockets in, you know, Iraq and other in the Arab world, but for the most part, they were gone from Palestine. And it wasn't until the 1880s under Theodore Herzl that this modern idea of of, of Zionism started to take hold, and that is, uh, you know, uh, people without a land to a land without a people. Well, of course they got a land because lots of Jews came to the United States, and we've offered a pretty darn good home for them and Poles and and Italians and, 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 and Haitians and Mexicans and you name it. Um, Irish, I mean, lots of groups came here and have prospered, and, and American Jews have prospered too. But this idea of Zionism was that, that they can go back to their biblical homeland. And so in the 1880s, 
um, Herzl started to encourage us and lobby the British government for this. And, uh, of course, the Ottoman Empire was in control of that part at the time. The, the Ottoman Empire takes over the Middle East around, in, based in Turkey around 1500 by taking over from the Byzantine Empire, which was nothing more than the Eastern Roman Empire. Uh, so they take over from the Byzantines. The Ottomans in, are in control until World War I, basically. And so Theodore Herzl has all these European Ashkenazi Jews coming over to, to uh, Palestine, uh, making, they call it Aliyah. Uh, it was like a religious pilgrimage where you go over to the your you know your ancient homeland, um, and so by 1920 or after World War One by 1920 census um, they've got 50,000 mostly European Jews living in Palestine under the British mandate, um, but of course there are 60,000 Arab Christians and 500,000 Arab Muslims, so they are a distinct minority and they weren't even from there, and of course their goal was to create a theocracy. And you can imagine when 50,000 people out of uh, 610 say, hey, uh, we're going to make this a theocracy and it's going to be our religion, not yours, you're going to have a lot of problems. And so uh, uh, Herzl and then, you know, the late Chaim Weitzman and the later uh, founders all realized that. And so they manip very successfully manipulated the Western governments because they had a lot of money. They had a very uh, uh, distinct goal of recreating uh, Israel. Um, they got the Balfour Declaration as a distraction. Uh, well, well let, let me back up a little bit. Okay. In 1917, two percent of the Russian Empire's population is Jewish. Uh, most of the Bolshevik leadership was Jewish, and they take down the Tsar, basically. Uh, meanwhile, um, the Kaiser, uh, World War I's a disaster for everybody, although the Germans had the upper hand in, in, 20, in 1916. The Kaiser reaches out to his cousin, King George of England, says, listen, cuz, let's call this whole thing off. Let's call it a draw. Go back to where we were. Um, it's not working out for anybody. Start over. And the German Jewish bankers sent a contingent over to meet with Lord Balfour, the British foreign secretary, and they said, listen, don't take this seemingly generous offer of an armistice. Um, we think we can get the United States to enter this war hmm. uh, on England's side. And if that happens, it should tip the balance in your favor. But if we do this, you got to do something for us, and that is support the creation of a Jewish homeland in Palestine. And that's what the famous Balfour Declaration is that Zionists use as justification. But of course, the Balfour Declaration simply says, His Majesty's government views with favor the establishment of a Jewish homeland in Palestine. And then they gave it to Woodrow Wilson, who added language about it, but nothing here shall be taken to deny the, the rights of the local uh, Arab population. And, uh, and of course, from day one, they've been denying the Arab population any semblance of, of, a, of a right. And so um, what happened was, um, you know, they were trying to get as many people. It's, from the beginning, it's been all about how to get more Jews into Palestine and get rid of the Arab population. That's always been the equation. It's been a mathematical uh, uh, problem from the get-go. And that's, what is, that's why it's so intractable, because even after World War II— uh, when there was an influx of refugees to that part of the world. Of course, the local Arab population, Palestinian population, is having lots and lots of kids, lots more kids than, than the Jews were having. So I think even now in the West Bank, there's something like 5 million Arabs. Uh, and even after you know, 50, 60 years of feverish settlement building by the Israelis, there's still only like 400,000, I think, uh, Israelis. Just don't procreate as prolifically? That's or? right. And the more yeah. educated, you know, it's kind of a demographics. Yeah. If the more you're educated, the smaller your family becomes. Right. The Russian uh, had the same problem. When the Soviet Union existed, the white Russians, who were the elite of Russia, they, you know, lived in Moscow and St. Petersburg, uh, and, and they were having fewer children. They lived in industrial areas. They were having, you know, 1.5 child or whatever it was. Meanwhile, in, in, in Kazakhstan, they're having, you know, eight kids. And uh, so the Russians, uh, towards the end of uh, the Soviet uh, Union, they were doctoring, it was believed, they were doctoring their statistics to show 51% of the population was still white Russians when they probably were a minority by then. So strings get pulled at high levels. Um, Israel and that territory gets given over. And everyone who lived there didn't get a vote. Yeah, yeah. what, hap what happened was uh, World War II created an enormous amount of sympathy uh, for the refugees from the Holocaust. But, of course, the Arabs would point out, hey, we didn't 
carry out the Holocaust. That happened in Germany or Europe. Why are we paying the price for this? And the reason they're paying the price for it is because that was Israel's location in the Bible. So um, the, the hardcore Zionists all wanted to go there. Um, a lot of refugees went there, but others came to the United States. We got a huge influx here in the United States. And, uh, and basically what happened was the American Jewish community and the European Jewish community were, were donating lots of money. Um, they were sending money over to uh, Menachem Begin, uh, Yitzhak Shamir. They were each the head of their own terrorist group over there. And they were trying to figure out how to get the British out of the area so they could basically take over and establish a Jewish homeland, which in 1948, what they call the War of Independence or the uh, the Palestinians call the Nakba. That's what happened. So and we're going to give you this territory. You can go in there. You can take over. Um, all the while, they're looking to expand. That's right. That's more, right. So the United more. Nations, which was really a creature of the the West, uh, uh, said, okay, we'll recognize this area, this small area for, for Jewish settlement. But of course, immediately they were working on expanding that area. And now they've taken over, you know, uh, as much land as they have. And of course the settlers, they're fanatics, you know, they'll take a trailer out in the middle of the night and set it up in some place. And they go, okay, this is, and they name it a community and they got their, uh, you know, their AK 47s to try to hold it. And then they brutalize the local Palestinian population trying to run them off. And of course in 1948, that's basically what happened. Um, the, uh, they were Western supplied. Okay. Interestingly, um, Robert Maxwell, Jelaine Maxwell's father, he was a Czech Jew, uh, and he migrated to England, became a big uh, media mogul. Ran a Ponzi scheme. Uh, yep, ran a Ponzi scheme, stole $400 million from their pension fund. Fell and off a boat. Fell off his boat, named the Jizlane off yeah. the Canary Islands in 1992. <laughs> and, um, named a boat but after he his got, daughter. But he procured two B-24s for the Israelis. So they, weren't, they were sophisticated European fighters with modern uh, Western weapons against a bunch of, you know, Bedouin sheep herders. Yeah. And uh, they they uh, and they were ruthless. Um, at one point, and I think I've told you this before, yeah. Dair Yassin, D E I R Y A S S I N, the local Palestinian said, "Look, they went to the local Jewish leaders in 1948. Said, look, let's just avoid the fighting. We just get along." And when Begin and Yet Yitzhak Shamir heard about that, they said, "We got to make an example of these people." They converged on the town. They massacred as many as 450 men, women, and children. Wow. And then they went around other communities and broadcast what they had done to instill fear in the community. And, and it, sure enough, 750,000 Palestinians fled as refugees, as people do when war comes to their neighborhood. They fully intend to come back when the fighting stopped. But when the fighting stopped here, they were not allowed back. The Israelis set up barriers and wouldn't let them come back in. And now their children and their children's children are the folks who are occupying the refugee camps. Uh, they've never been allowed to go home. Their villages have been wiped out. And, of course, this is largely unknown to the American public because the American media is very heavily influenced by Zionists. Why? They own it. So this is this is something I really wanted to. This is a great segue because you talked about settlers. And we talked about how 2.5% of Americans are, or the American population is Jewish. But could you expound upon a little bit of Christian Zionism? And its influence on on media, on propaganda, but also monetarily in these efforts. Yes, that's why Walt and Mearsheimer's book is called The Israel Lobby and U.S. Foreign Policy, because they include the Israel lobby uh, for the evangelicals. And as they also said, um, the, uh, the American Jewish Zionist community provides the money. You know, the, the Zuckerbergs and the George Soroses and the Michael That's Bloomberg's. Your war chest. Yes, yes. I mean, most of our oligarch billionaires are, in fact, Jewish and supporters of Israel. James. Well, Carter. I'm going to pull up some figures on that, but I think there's a lot of money being funneled by evangelical they, efforts. Well, and, they provide the brawn, is what Walt Mearsheimer said. He said the American Jewish Zionists provide the brains and the evangelicals provide the brawn. Mm -hmm. And those are the folks who are consider themselves, you know, devout Christians, whose preacher may be that John Hagee, that nut down yeah. in San Antonio, and they are, their reasoning is, God told us we got to support these yeah. people. And, the, yeah. and that's, just, that's well, the just extent of their the, knowledge. Just for the people out there, could you, could you talk about the philosophy of Christian, Christian Zionism? And it's root in the Bible. Maybe uh, Jess knows more, but like... yeah, I'm not really qualified. Other than they, the, you know, this idea of Judeo Christianity, I would argue that Judaism is actually against Christianity, and they've been fighting against 
uh, Christianity and Western civilization since the Romans booted them out. Okay, yeah, I don't think a lot of people wait, wait, before, know before what before Jude, there, uh, Judeo-Christian actually means. And they say things like, this country was founded on the bedrock of Judeo-Christian That's right, beliefs. that's right. And I think that's a scam to try to make it look like we've got the same values. And, and Dennis Prager talks about that. And Dennis Prager is a brilliant guy. I listen to him. I admire him in so many ways. But but it's basically for foreign policy. It's a scam. Um, you know, uh, the history. They have been fighting Christianity. I'm not. I'm not really religious. So I consider myself. You know, I'm from a Christian family, part of product of Christian culture. But, but um, you know, in 1190, they got kicked out of England by Edward the First, Edward Longshanks, because uh, they came in with William the Conqueror in 1056, and by by 1290, Aaron of Lincoln is the richest guy in England. And they had a riot in York, and they massacred uh, over 100 uh, of the Jewish community up there. And 1290, he kicks them out. And uh, of course. Um, in, in the Iberian Peninsula in the 1490s, uh, when the Catholics reassert control over the entire peninsula, they kick the Moors back to North Africa, and there's a sizable Jewish community. And um, they said, okay, uh, anybody that stays has to convert to Catholicism. Um, if you refuse to convert, you got six months to divest and get out. And 150,000 Jews went over the border to, to Portugal, and 10 years later, they were booted out of Portugal. And the Inquisition was really inquiring into whether those folks who said they had converted had, in fact, converted. Um, so, um, they, and then, of course, you know, the Russian Revolution in 1917 with the Bolsheviks, and then, you know, the Balfour Declaration in Everybody's fighting wars trying to tell the other side that they're not worshiping well, or praying now, correctly. Well, now when you look and see who's funding all this, you know, erasing of gender, you know, I mean, who, George Soros, all these oligarch billionaires, who were put... Zuckerberg okay, put okay, up $412 okay, million. Let's, let's go there. I like where mm -hmm. you're going, but I just want to put this out there for the people. Christian Zionism is the belief that that... The rapture will be triggered when all Jews return to Jerusalem. And yes. Yeah, when they're all back in the yes. Holy right. Land. Which yes. is, which is, I, I just think for the internet, that's an, that, that's, that's yes. Wild. And then everybody dies. Uh, well, and that's then, widely uh, held. They convert. And they all go to hell. I yes. mean, all the all the people they are advocating for the, in Jerusalem go to hell. But I, do I they go to hell or that. do they go to heaven because they converted? Well, they they can do choose to convert I well guess. god has to know your god, only god can know your intentions so okay. he'll decide at the pearly gates did you really convert or did you not okay and but okay if back, you back to back to uh, gender oh. erasure being being funded by george soros yes these progressive ideas okay there there, there is and I, I probably talked about it last time but i remember in high school having an argument with a guy named mike coda and he was on the cross country team. Mike Cota later worked for Bill Bradley when he became a senator, along oh, okay. with some of the other guys I was in high school with. But Cota was telling me how sovereign nations are obsolete. There shouldn't be a country. There shouldn't be a United States. That we really are just common mankind. And uh, I thought that was just so crazy at the time. But of course now we see Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forum and these globalists, and it's basically the same idea. This idea that that it's not fair for people to live in Western Europe and the United States and have steak for dinner and to have a, you know, drive uh, two cars and so on, where some people are eating, you know, fried lizards in Uganda, that there should be a redistribution of everything worldwide. And, uh, of course, that means there's no self-determination. That means you've got to turn over all authority to this, whoever this central group is. Um, and uh, and uh, that's that's frightening. So is the goal then, like c coming back to the gender fluid and, and uh, you said like erasing gender, this effort, this what seems to be in the last, what, two years? Ten years. Or three yeah, years? Yeah, I'd say ten. Just I'm saying, ten? Really? Yeah, it's in, been going in terms on for a while. Top of mind, though, and, culturally? Well, of course, infiltration of the schools. What's the goal there, though? Why One world government. I think the world is there should be no gender, no nationality, uh, unless you're part of God's chosen people, because I don't think the ultra-Orthodox communities are adopting any of this No, they're nonsense. not. No, right. they're, they're conservative like conservative Christian would be. And, uh, you know, one woman married forever and, and procreate with your wife. Um, and so... These other folks, you know, some Jews, they call us goyim, okay? They consider us non-Jews to be above beasts but below them. Right. And so you could make an argument that they are the ultimate white supremacists. 
wow. um, that they are God's chosen people, whether it's cultural or whether it's religion. And I know lots of Jewish friends who are cultural, they're secular, but they nevertheless, uh, you know, are proud that they're Jewish and think Israel needs, you know, we need to back Ukraine and we need to back Israel and so on and so forth. Uh, so, yeah. so Jewish globalism is kind of funding the effort to yes to uh, strip people of their gender identities so that kind patriotic of patriotic identities yeah, right. and i don't know that much about it but I, I did some research and there's a concept that a rabbi came up with in the 16th century called the tikkum olam t i k k u n o l a m and it's this moral code that there that i think the idea is that if you're jewish this is your moral code and you've got a greater uh, uh, duty to adhere to this then you do your own nation's laws and of course wherever large communities have settled repairing the world wherever large communities have settled they've created a problem it's rather than just assimilate like the irish have or the poles or the italians or the mexicans or the haitians they stick together they have their own communities their own country clubs they buy the newspaper outlets or media outlets like they have and they run the nation's financial system which is the source of you know enormous wealth and power that they then donate i think i saw somewhere 60 percent of federal campaign dollars are donated by american jews people like paul singer people never even heard of him or james crown died a couple months ago crashing his sports car up at aspen i'd never heard of james crown so i Google it. Take your phone out. Who's James Crown? Well, that's his name, family name changed. He was the scion of a $10 billion family fortune from Chicago. He was a frequent guest at the White House under Biden, and he contributed to liberal Democratic causes. But most people have never even heard of, of these people. Um, um, they should use their, do their own research. Pull your phone out. Google these people, see who's giving their, where they're sending their money to. You know, they always talk about um, the Koch brothers because they're not Jewish, basically. Um, and they're more libertarian anyway. They believe in gay marriage, I think ending the drug war, non-interventionism. Um, but the folks who are really funding the Joe Bidens uh, and the Obamas and the Clintons, uh, they tend to be overwhelmingly leftist, democratic, and, uh, Ju and Jewish. Is a one world order and globalism and no countries and no genders and no actual individual sovereignty. That's just a follow the money play. Yes. That's just you. We plug you into the matrix. You're just a battery. You get your two weeks a year. You're all going to eat the yes, same food. You're basically a workhorse, I think. Yeah. Um, with no self determination. So really. Wait, wait, wait. What? Sorry, go ahead, Jess. Well, so really, we've made no advancement. It's like what George Carlin used to say about about they want you just smart enough to run their machines. Yeah. Okay. So, so having the autonomy and personal freedoms to determine your own identity and way of expression in the world is actually uh, the opposite of that. Is what you're. Well, that's about. right. Western political philosophy is individualism. That's why the West was so successful, because it's so dynamic, because you have, you know, the room to rise to the top, which, you know, what immigration is in the United States. You got a great idea. You're ambitious. You come over here. I mean, look at all these tech billionaires. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, every time there's a scientific uh, Nobel Prize, it's won by an American, but he's actually from another right, country. But I'm, I'm referring to the non-aggression principle, right, that you... Uh, you're you should be able to do whatever you That's want right. to do right live and let live when we're ta live and let live when we're talking about we're making a big point on gender and that being funded by uh some like legitimate uh organizations out there or whatever um i t to me that doesn't work that's cognitive cognitively dissonant because you're promoting uh are you saying it's an illusion of choice Perhaps. Yeah, I think it's determined by your X, uh, X, Y chromosomes. It's uh, you're born one or the other. And, and if you think you're not, it's probably a mental illness issue. Um, and you're not doing people any favors by encouraging that. Um, unless your goal is to is to sow dissension, promote identity politics, uh, turn man against I, I'm woman, pretty sure and the so people, on. I'm pretty sure the people who... Uh, struggle with gender identity um, are the ones that don't want to be perceived. The ones who, who are actually making an, an identity politic politic 
issue is the opponents or the people who espouse your point of view? Well, well, uh, probably probably a little of both. Um, I, I I remember reading okay, one deal, study. Deal. They, well, one study I read was talking about most of the people who are struggling with their gender identity, if left to their own devices, would just turn out to be gay and would accept the that fact that they're is, gay. Uh, the, I, as the fact checker here, I don't, I'm going to look that up. Okay. Yes. Well, I mean, there's a bit, everybody's look got everything. opinions, right? So yeah. is there, so when you say destabilization is a goal, right? Is all part of this yes. tribalism. Yes. Let's turn, let's turn this person against dividing, that person. Divide and conquer. In other yeah. words, if you want to subsume the United States and England uh, and Russia and uh, Germany into this new world order, it's a real problem if those countries are successful sovereign nations. Right. And it's not a coincidence that the media hates Trump and hates Putin, and hated Bolsonaro in Brazil, and hates Maloney in Italy, and hates uh, Geertz Wilders, the newly elected prime minister in, in Holland, and, and Javier Argentinian. Malai, that's right, in yep. Argentina, the libertarian. and Victor Orban in Hungary. They hate all those people, and what they have in common is they're all anti-globalist. Trump went to the World Economic Forum, Malai just did it a few, like a month ago, and went to the World Economic Forum and say, it's not happening on my watch. You know, F, F you, not going to happen. What do you think about all of this anti-Semitism across the board, especially in our, you know, ivory tower? Or I think it, that argument is used by the Zionists as a shield to discourage people from critically evaluating the actual historical facts. And um, people, because of the Internet, because, you know, you can't, but they haven't been able to buy, although, of course, Zuckerberg tried real hard uh, and, and high tech has tried real hard because of the Internet. People are free to compare notes and do their own research. And people are starting to notice that, you know, uh, these far left folks who are funding this and who are in Biden's cabinet. How many what a huge percentage are Jewish. And so it's it stands to reason that some people are going to go, hey. Uh, is this a coincidence? Like Dave Chappelle's joke. Remember Dave, when he hosted yeah. Saturday Night Live, he, he said, you get a group of blacks and it's a gang, you know, uh, a group of Italians, it's a mob. But if it's a group of Jews, it's a coincidence. Um, and uh, not all Jews are Zionists. And that's an important distinction to make. Um, um, but uh, a lot are Zionists, and especially the ones who are committed enough to, to devote hundreds of millions or even billions of dollars uh, to try to carry out their goal of recreating biblical Israel and maybe running the world in a new world order. And even when you um, point out what appear to be actual f historical facts or actual numbers or actual studies, it's such a hot button topic. That's right. That uh, if you step off one side or the off the fence off one side or the other, you could you could really be risking getting canceled. You are risking dealing with some very well connected people who could make life miserable for you. I, I, I'm trying to think of the the uh, the Jewish law professor that was up for tenure. I think at the University of Chicago, and he was the son of Holocaust survivors, and he is critical of Israel. And Alan Dershowitz. Um, who is a big civil libertarian in the United States, but is basically an Israeli supremacist when it comes to Israeli matters. He wrote the book, The, the Case for Torture. Um, but he led the effort from his, from his position at Harvard to block, the, uh, to block the tenure appointment of this other Jewish law professor um, because he was insufficiently devoted to the Israeli cause. Wow, insufficiently devoted, and 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 and, and because that, he was critical. Yes, and that and of course, you know, the comeback to that is, oh my gosh, look at Israel, that their their body politic, half the Israeli population is critical of the far right. That's why they have to have a coalition government now. In the early days of Israel, it was founded by the Abba Ibn's and the Golda Meir's, and those folks were Ashkenazi Jews, and they tended to be uh, the Labor Party, which was the dominant party, but it morphed over the years as they died off and more Sephardic Jews from the Middle East uh, came in, and then when the Soviet Union imploded and they emigrated from the USSR, they came to Israel, and that was that's another side story. They convinced Bush one not to let the uh, emigres from the Soviet Union uh, come to the United States. Uh, the Israelis begged him to to 
not do that because then they would be forced under their idea of Zionism to go, go to Israel. And, of course, Bush won, said, okay, but if I do this, you cannot settle them in the occupied territories, which international law recognizes. They needed people. Yes, they wanted to people. settle. Yes. Right. And of course, immediately they double crossed Bush one because they said, OK, we won't settle them in the occupied territories. And then they settled them in the occupied territories. They build subsidized housing in the West Bank, kind of like think of our village here in Dallas. You know, hey, these modern apartments with tennis courts and swimming pool for four hundred dollars. Why would you want to live in Tel Aviv and pay eight hundred dollars? And so they started settling them there. And that's when Bush one retaliated and. Uh, he said uh, he cut off their loan guarantees. Okay, now in foreign aid, when we give most of our foreign aid, let's say we give it to Brazil. Okay, we give Brazil two hundred million dollars. It's a basically they have to agree if it's for farm aid, they got to come back and buy John Deere tractors. Okay, it helps John Deere. They're spending the money here in the United States. We're getting a benefit from it. And it also gives us some control over what happens in Brazil because they want to continue to get that aid. With Israel, who is the largest single recipient of of U.S. foreign aid. And has been. And has been. They get various amounts, but the the official amount is $5 billion a year. And they get it on January 1st. They get it up front with no strings attached. Okay, so they can take that money. They can lobby our elections. They can uh, earn interest on it, make money on it, whatever they want to do. And um, so Bush had said, listen, if you double cross me, I'm going to cut off loan guarantees, which means when you borrow money, you're going to have to pay more to borrow it. And so he followed through on that. And even though he went from an 80 percent approval rate after Desert Storm, okay, he went to being a one term president. Uh, because the Israel lobby uh, pulled the rug out from under him. They decided, okay, he just screwed us uh, on this, so we're going to not support him. And they went out and, and of course, Ross Pro ran and, and Bill Clinton ran, and they got rid of Bush 1. And Bush 1 acknowledges it. I mean, there's a, I, there's a clip of him uh, basically saying, look, looks what I get for you know following through with what I said. Um, it cost him his second term, basically. What's up with this just – what? what's up with the blank check? What's up with the blind loyalty? What's up with the – yeah, I'll, I'll do this for Same you guys. Same reason Nikki Haley, every third word out of her mouth is Israel, Israel, Israel. Yeah. Okay? There, there's an establishment. If you want to run for office, you, need, you money. need to raise money, especially if you're in the House of Representatives every two years. That's what the founders intended. You're constantly raising money. And so you know if you do not – toe the line when it comes to Israel and aid to Israel and backing them with unconditional support, you will find a well-funded opponent against you, okay? And, and, and we probably talked about this before, but William J. Fulbright, the senator from Arkansas, he was a giant in the Senate, and he had the temerity to come out and say that basically uh, Israel, you know, was occupying Congress. I mean, they had too much power. They went out and got Dale Bumpers to run against them, gave him uh, all kinds of money, and defeated William J. Fulbright. They did the same thing to Charles Percy in the state of Illinois, who was a presidential candidate. Uh, they defeated him. And when they do that, they hold up their scalp to the rest of the c- Congress members and say, look, you know, this person wasn't saved. So fall in line or we're going to fuck yes, you or you're, up. Yes, or you're done. And I had this conversation, too, at the courthouse with a Dallas city councilman, the late uh, John Loza. And then uh, Roberto Alonso. And they had both been approached by groups. Because, you know, if you get elected to Congress, you will be approached by the Israel lobby and offered a free trip to go to Israel. And then they take you around and escort you. And they escort you uh, and show you the sites they want. They're not going to show the bad stuff, you know, the, what they're doing to the Palestinians or the, you know, the really bad neighborhoods. They're going to they're going to take you around and show you their sites and they get to take your measure. And if your attitude is, you know, that's great. I wish you all the best of luck. But this really isn't the, you know, the United States is uh, uh, bailiwick. This is not really up to us, um, you know, then you go on their doo-doo list. Uh, if you're like, yeah, I'm, you know, I, my God tells me I got to support you and I'm all for you know, Israel and expanding their borders or giving you whatever you need to achieve your goals, then when you get back, they give you the list of deep-pocketed donors, call these folks, and you won't have any trouble raising your money. And, of course, um, that's the way the game works. That's why so much money goes to federal elections um, and until George Soros is kind of figuring out you can do it locally, too, when um, you hear, which may even be more effective. But. When you hear the media or, or 
uh, people who are um, rebuffing, you know, the legacy media, the mainstream media's coverage of this, which all has that Israel angle on it. And they're saying, no, this is a genocide. What's happening in Palestine to the Palestinian man in the street is wrong. The whole world knows it's a genocide. The folks who are trying to claim it's not by putting reports of rising anti-Semitism on there is the media. And Iran. Yes. This it, is it, all it, Iran. It, it, yes, this is, that's their ulterior motive. But the genocide in Gaza is so obvious and so brutal that it's causing... I saw one meme, it, was a, it said, it was an older Jewish guy saying, uh, the Holocaust made me afraid to be a Jew. Uh, Gaza is making me ashamed to be a Jew. And I have one friend who's married to a Jewish woman, and for the first time, and he always keeps his mouth shut because he doesn't want to create any friction at her family functions or whatever, and he said that for the first time his wife is starting to question uh, what they're doing over there. So uh, there's some evidence that, that what's happening in Gaza is Netanyahu overplaying his hand uh, and exposing the uh, the hard Israeli right for what they are. He's already said he's not for a two-state solution. There's a lot of speculation. That so no compromise. That's right. And there's a lot of speculation that he wants to expand the war, that he may be done uh, once this uh, uh, project is over. Um, It'll be his life's work. Yes, yes. And so he wants to expand it into Lebanon by taking on Hezbollah and into the West Bank. And, of course, the fear is amongst experts that, you know, Biden or the committee behind him will be dumb enough to take the bait and do it and uh, have a, you know, widespread war, wider spread war in the Middle East, which, of course, could lead to World War Three. After the terrorist attack on the rave, what would have been a more appropriate response than the one that continues to drag on oh uh, you talk about october 7th yeah, yeah. what started um, all this yeah well, well what's what's the background there of course the, the israelis have been brutalizing the palestinians since they've been emigrating over it since they moved in over there um and of course i mean whether it was uh you know 1956 40 1948 1956 the yom kippur war 1973 uh 1967 six-day war they've been doing this all along now they've got them quietly locked away in places like gaza which has been described as an open air uh concentration camp um these people don't you know get to guard their own borders they don't get to uh pump out their oil and gas that's on their coast they don't get to go out in the water and fish they don't get to do all the things that a, you know somebody that has uh, their own a know, sovereign sovereignty nation, yes, yeah. can do, and um, and so um, what happened with Trump? Trump was rather than pursuing the two state solution uh, up front, and some of this is speculation, okay, uh, based on my knowledge of you know, the history area. But he was doing a bi bipartisan. He would go with each individual Arab entity and try to have an agreement with the Israelis and them. And so I think what may have happened is the Israelis figured out, hey, we'll do this with Saudi Arabia. We'll do this with all our Arab uh, countries that we don't get along with. And that will take care of the Palestinians are on the back burner. The, you know, these countries are no longer willing to go to the mat for the Palestinians. We'll take care of it that way. Well, I'm sure the Palestinians didn't like being put on the back burner and being ignored. And so they had an incentive to strike out and say, hey, we're still here. Uh, you know, they're, they're basically, they're desperate. It's not like they can write letters to their congressman. Hey, uh, you know, please change your policy. Uh, you know, may I, Yo. so the recent spotlight on Israel and Palestine has brought from the woodworks, a bunch of different flavors of anti-Zionists, some who, you know, uh, everything you just said about the funding and politicians, that's how they would uh, justify the U.S. support for Israel. Then there's others who are just like, it's a genocide. What about the freedom, the rights, the well-being of the Palestinian people? Those people tend to not point to the funding and the, uh, I don't want to say conspiratorial thinking, but maybe in the mainstream that's what they would say. What do those people who are just anti-Zionists for the freedom of the Palestinians, the free Palestine people, the BDS people, what is their reasoning for America supporting Palis uh, Israel so heavily? Well, the BDS people and the Free Palestine people are people that are aware of the genocide, aware of the long history of oppression of the Palestinians. Um, so 
So those are the folks that are aware enough. But what would they say is the reason for America supporting Israel this? Money. So the same thing you said. Power. Money and power. Follow the money. Like I said, 60% of the, the dollars in federal campaigns come from Jewish Americans. Uh, primarily from the big spending being, oligarch billionaires. So, so being uh, observing BDS meetings or uh, observing people in those camps, there's never that much of a push to say it is all the way to you know one world uh, like globalism. Like that in those circles seems anti-Semitic. What do you say? To that? Well, it's anti-Zionism is different from anti-Semitism. Agreed, and that's and that's an important distinction to make. Just go back a little bit in twenty. So maybe maybe when you were arguing about the funding being from Jews, it's from I guess it's, it's from, from Zionists, Zionists. Exactly. Including, including Christian, Christian Zionists. Zionists. There you go. But they tend not. There's not a whole lot of billionaires that are right. Christian Just Zionists. Just like you said, the brawn versus the brain. Yes, yes. Those are the folks that you know live in small town America, uh, go to the local church. Um, um, but just, just to go back a little bit, just to show you that, how the funding works, Chaim Saban, the creator of the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, is a, an American billionaire, Israeli-born, naturalized American. Um, and uh, he was buddies with Shel the late Sheldon Adelson. And Sheldon Adelson and, and Saban would go around to Jewish audiences and would tell those audiences what they need to do to influence U.S. government policy in favor of Israel. And, and, and what they would do is, they, uh, Saban said, you need to do three things. You need to contribute uh, to campaigns, you need to fund think tanks, and you need to buy media outlets. And to uh, his credit, he was the number one contributor in the 2016 cycle to, the, to Hillary in the, on the Democrat side. How much did he give her? Uh, I, I don't know, but at the end of the year, according to one of the books I read, he wrote another check for $500. I mean, that power So he'd be number money. one. Yes, yes. So he, he so so Saban contributed the most money and then he gave twelve million dollars, I think, to the Brookings Institute, which renamed its Middle East Policy Center, the Saban Institute for Middle East uh, Studies. So good luck getting an objective report out of them. And then he went and he bought Univision, okay, the largest Spanish language uh, network in North America. And so he put his money where his mouth is. And his my favorite quote was, you've heard of a single-issue voter? I'm a single-issue voter. And that issue is Israel. And Sheldon Adelson was his buddy, who was at the time the eighth richest man in the world. And, uh, you know, he owns the Venetian in Vegas, and he owns in Macau. He's got gambling interests. He, he died, what, two years ago, I think? His wife, Miriam, has now taken over. But they each were the number one contributor to their respective parties, but they're good buddies, and they agree that, you know, it's important. Uh, their most important issue is getting the United States to do Israel's bidding. Let's be real clear. What do you? How would you define the difference between anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism? Well, well, I mean, Judaism because is a those, religion. Those those terms are not interchangeable, uh, and yet people use the the term anti-Semite. Very freely nowadays. They use it because it's a, like I said, it's a shield. Okay, it's if you don't promote sweeping. gay marriage, you're a homophobe. All right. If you didn't support Hillary for president, what are you afraid of strong women? So that same and if tactic, you voted for Trump, you put you're your a white the supremacist. Yes, yes. So you put that other person on the defensive right. rather Polarized. than actually discussing the issues or the facts. You put the other side. Label uh, really, you, cancel you, defeat you. Yes, yes. The, the psychological element of it too of Jews worldwide are still reeling from the Holocaust. So the, there is a psychological element of being, you know, on the defensive. Well, but that and it's and, used to the advantage of the Zionists. So there are not a whole lot of ho Holocaust exactly. survivors still alive. OK, um, that most mostly they've passed on just like World War Two generations pass, passing on. Um, um, but it's very convenient to use that to get their way. Um, and, and, you know, there, there are Jewish communities throughout the Middle East that have been tolerated for thousands of years. I mean, um, it's just not that big a deal. I mean, you can be Muslim, and they're tolerant of the Jewish communities um, and Christian communities, like in Lebanon, you know, before Lebanon got destroyed. Um, 
You know, I mean, people can all live together. The problem happens when you've got one side trying to impose its will on everybody else. And by the way, we settled uh, in, uh, we did a college simulation in foreign policy class, and we settled the whole problem in the Middle East with this simulation. And it was a two state solution. Israel went back to its 67 borders. In, uh, Jerusalem was an international city since it's so important to three worldwide religions. And the Palestinian refugees gave up their right of return in exchange for financial compensation. What is right of return? Well, the, the, the guys who got kicked out, the Palestinians right. and their, their children and grandchildren who got uh, booted out of their villages in what is now Israel, that were not allowed to go back to their villages and resume you know, their homes, um, they're entitled to financial compensation. And when you think about how much money we give Israel and how much money we spend on war and how much it costs us, it would be cheaper to give each one of those refugee families a half a million dollars or whatever uh, to give up that right of return and then go to where they want to live. I mean, imagine you've been living in squalor for all that time and you've got kids or grandkids and now you got a check for $500,000. You can send them all to college. You can build a home. You could do, you could live the good life. Sure. On an actuarial table, that makes sense to a, a logical person, to a person deeply influenced by like, religion or historical roots or any of that that good luck oh it would never work out right because when you look at war most war all war really boils down to uh differences in beliefs and those beliefs are dialed into the fulcrum of those beliefs beliefs is is religion so when you're fighting a war and you've got righteous indignation on your side, it does not matter if women and children become casualties of that war, collateral damage, because you are literally doing God's work in your own mind, right? It's 2024, and that's still where we're at. Well, so, some people are motivated by that. Some, of course, the people who are most motivated are the people that feel they're defending their homeland. That's why you know Afghanis keep doing so well, um, and we've had trouble trying to subjugate the Middle East you know, with our high tech weapons, still can't seem to have our way. Um, and just like the Minutemen took on the British, hiding behind trees. Yeah. You know, you get real motivation if you're defending yourselves rather than trying to occupy and control a foreign land or population. Yeah, especially when you uh when you're the underdog, you're fighting harder. You know, that's uh when you're defending right. your land but you're... Mo- most people of course like the military's having trouble uh, recruiting now because big time because yeah people are starting to figure out and I don't know how many times the government can lie and get away with those lies but if you go back through history it goes all the way back to ancient Athens where they were using subterfuge uh, to get their governments to fund or the people to support a war um, you know Pearl Harbor uh, was basically one of uh, FDR's advisors his, his quote was uh, the secret was trying to figure out how to get the Japanese to throw the first punch yeah okay they didn't know maybe it was coming in Pearl Harbor but we had them blockaded we weren't returning their phone calls there were warnings we wanted too. Them to do it that's right yeah that Pearl Remember Harbor main, was about to happen the Spanish American War yeah. okay that was the boiler blowing up we used that as an excuse under Teddy Roosevelt to go uh, to to go take on Spain and seize Cuba actually it was McKinley was the president at the time um and, uh, of course, the Lusitania going down, getting us into World War I. Um, the Gulf of Tonkin, we now know, was a scam. And, of course, like I said earlier, all this, you know, Iran-backed militia. A bomb went off by this Iran-backed group. They're, they're doing the same thing. They're and, doing and the same thing. people are catching on to that. They did the same thing in 9-11. They said yes. weapons of mass yes. destruction. Colin Powell lied. Maybe he didn't want to, but he still did. He got set up. He later... He, he, he got set up. His chief of staff, Lawrence Wilkerson, retired colonel, is very uh, vocal about it because he feels like they got screwed. He so got bad. leveraged and didn't have time to consider his options. Yes. yes. And should have said, we're postponing they, they this press knew conference. They there was no weapons of mass destruction. No, absolutely it not. It was a lie from the get-go. If we can convince the American people that this war is justified, that it's just, That's and right. that we're snuffing right. out evil, right? How often is that term used? And after used? Vietnam, we were very reticent to go off 
and fight another foreign war. Well, we got our teeth knocked out because we went in there half-assed well, and was, tied one of our own arms behind our well, back. It was, yeah, well, it was also a really dumb idea as part of containment, the post-World War II philosophy of containing the big red scare, which we were wrong completely about. We thought communism was a, a monolithic block and that the Russians and the Chinese, we ignored a thousand years of animosity between the two countries and thought that they were going to cooperate and take over the whole planet unless we could ring... Uh, both of those countries with a series of military bases uh, all the way around, starting, you know, Alaska, Japan, Taiwan, Formosa, you know, Southeast Asia, uh, and so on. And, of course, um, they eventually ruptured because they were historic enemies, even though they both called themselves communists. They were very different from one another. Um, <clears throat> anyway, um, containment, even the author of containment, uh, said it was misused. It wasn't. He never intended it to be that way. But it was very handy, and it got people riled up and scared, and spent a lot of money from the military-industrial complex. Is it a coincidence that there were no major conflicts for four years, and now literally, it goes uh, retract from Afghanistan six months later, Ukraine, Russia six, eight, ten I mean, months later. Trump? Yeah, yeah. No, that's not a coincidence at all. I think that's uh, he was effective in making other opponents question what his response would be so they were you know not wanting to do anything to test but him. that dried up that dried that's up right. that i don't think people economy are afraid. driver we put pro- we project project weakness under yeah. biden it's obvious i mean you look at him and world leaders are looking at him going that idiot's not in control he's not making the right. decisions um just a puppet yeah it's pretty obvious it's like really not hard to put no. Two and two together no. there. No matter who you voted for. You have for, to be willfully ignoring it. If Well, I mean, there's a lot of people who supported the hell out of Biden and are now going, what in the world is yes. this? And like for Hillary. He's running again? And like for Hillary, if they stay home, the damage is done. They don't have to vote for Trump or the other side. They have to stay home. Wow. Um, but um, incidentally, I wanted, I wanted to say this, what's interesting, the way it's playing out with, with uh, Nikki Haley. Um, because she is, Bill Crystal's behind her, mm-hmm. okay? The neocons are behind her. And the reason they're behind her is not because they think she could win the presidency, but as long as they have Plan B occupying the Republican nomination, that means all bases are covered. Sure. And and I think I may have told you this before about that TED Talk, yeah. um, where they talked about how, you know, a very tiny percentage of Americans get to pick, really, in the primaries, who, and give the money to, to select who is the Democratic nominee and who's the Republican nominee. And if they can get Nikki Haley occupying the Republican nominee, position they have accomplished what they want there's They'll no way that's happening that. well no there's not but but, I mean, but it's interesting to see how the media keeps promoting her she's closing the gap you see all these you know newsweek articles uh you know it's always the same she's down by like 10 tries well, right she now. just lost to like none of the above in, in yeah. nevada and and so <clears throat> um what happens if other states start following Colorado's lead well, and start just Supreme taking Court heard Trump arguments off. today. They're yeah. hearing arguments today, and the short clip I heard was John Roberts uh, ve- sounding very skeptical of the Colorado attorney, saying, "What's to stop? Uh, although, if we were to, you know, accept your argument, what's to stop other states from yeah. throwing the Democrat off next time? A bunch of states throw this Democrat off, and others will throw the Republican off, and uh, and yeah, that's that's a legitimate concern. Is Trump gonna is 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 Trump going to get found guilty of a felony? So he's not he's not eligible I think in I November. Think they're pushing the, everything back until after the election to dry, so that so that he's, he's be, I think up. he'll be on the ballot and he'll get elected. And if they push everything back, then I guess he could I guess he could pardon himself. Um, but I his argument, his attorney's argument, and I think it's legitimate. Because this otherwise shows that lawfare works, and this will simply set a precedent. You know, the Republicans set a precedent by going after Bill Clinton on impeachment. Right. Okay, it was stupid. Um, and then, of course, sure enough, it got turned around, and they went after the Republicans with it. The same thing will happen with this. It's called lawfare. And and the problem uh, is, is the president should have immunity for anything he does unless you impeach and remove him. Now you can charge him with something. So the president, let's say, Ob- remember Obama yep. had people killed with drones, including yes. U.S. citizens? Yes. And you, had, uh, and you had Rand Paul on the Senate filibustering John Brennan, saying, called it killed without a court date. Okay? 
you couldn't try him for murder while he's president. Yeah. But if you impeached him and removed him, now you could now charge he's him eligible. with the crime. Yeah, unless he first pardoned himself. Do you think that the do, do you think that the the waves of public sentiment have have turned so much that that Trump pulls it off in November? Uh, I think yes, yes. I think when you look objectively at all the, what they're reporting about how how significant numbers of blacks are supporting Trump. Um, Hispanics too. Yes, Hispanics. Well, Hispanics that are here that you know work and you know have families, they care about the same things everybody else cares yep. about. So um, um, that may be different from the folks who just got here who shouldn't be voting anyway because they're not U.S. citizens. Yeah, that conspiracy theory falls apart really fast, and you're like, they're bringing all these people over to affect the 2024 they're November to change election. The, the demographics of America basically is what's going on. They're trying to take down the United States to subsume us into the new world order. It's not a coincidence that we have immigration here at the same time they're doing it in Europe. Remember, we went into Libya. We yeah. broke Libya and flushed out so many in the Arab world into Europe. Well, it wasn't practical for them to come over here. That's where you know South America comes in. So they're trying to change the demographics. They're trying to end sovereign nations as we know by pitting group against group, identity politics, and sowing chaos. Because when there's chaos, people look to central strong leaders. Do something, government, protect us. Right. Which is exactly what Hitler used the Reichstag fire for in 1932. He created a Gestapo and a centralized government right after he got elected in, in Germany. And that's exactly what uh, the Marxist... Uh, Marxist globalists, uh, Democrats, are trying to use that January 6th nonsense. Create a rallying point and, uh, yeah, and get everybody in a hubbub. And then you've got all the power and the reach you want. Yes, yes. Look at 9-11. Yeah. And well, now well, every text message, phone, how about, that's call, right. they spy email, they can look at anything. All the time, that's right. Anything they want, anywhere, and y'all said it was okay. Because you believed them, and we that bitch about some terrorists. We bitch about TikTok. Yeah, and that they're spying on us, as if the argument is only our government can spy on us. Right. You know, we don't want any government spying on us. When you uh, hear some conspiracy theorists talk about false flags, or f talk about, hey, that uh, that terror attack on that rave that has kicked all this Israel Gaza stuff off, that was that was orchestrated, or 9/11 was orchestrated. It get it's getting harder yes. and harder and harder to ignore those people who I say like, those. I things. like the meme. It said, uh, "I'm a conspiracy, I'm a conspiracy theorist, and my pronouns are I told you so." <laughs> Right. It's almost um, like we're in a movie. The COVID scamdemic. Right. Okay. I mean, yeah. yeah, it was a virus, but yeah, it was probably, uh, you know, we, we started, gave it to the Chinese. It leaked out of the Wuhan lab uh, intentionally or unintentionally. And then it was used to basically try to fix an election. Transfer and wealth. To, and, yeah, and transfer billions of dollars. That's it. And, uh, and now, you know, we realize it was a, a bunch of crap. Water down the middle and class. And get ready, they're going to try it again. Take away everyone's independence. That's right. Take away everyone's sovereignty. Fill everyone with fear. That's a, that's a recipe for success right, right there. That's right. When you look at the mainstream press, understand that it's propaganda, that they are trying to herd you in a certain direction. You should be asking yourself, I wonder what they want me to believe. Do and it doesn't matter whether it's CNN or MSNBC or Fox. Or Fox. Okay, it, they're all propaganda arms. It's 100% true. All they're doing is getting you on there to watch so you watch the next ad, for fuck's sake. For it's Pfizer. pretty obvious. Yeah. Yes. Uh, give Travis Kelsey $20 million to shoot a Pfizer commercial and then date Taylor Swift. <laughs> and Taylor Swift says Biden's the man. And now every, every knucklehead out there who can't think for themselves is like, oh, I'm doing the right thing. You yeah. know, I, I'm doing what, I'm they, doing they what everybody else is doing. people thinking for themselves. That seems to be pretty obvious. Uh, the people who do think for themselves, who even ask just critical questions like Rogan, are automatically just... Well, look what they're doing over uh, uh, Tucker Carlson. Yeah. Tr going over to the Soviet Union, or to Russia to interview Putin. Yep. I mean, their heads are exploding. They can't... I saw Ali Vichy last night on MSNBC. They were talking about how he's a real journalist. And, who does he think yeah, he and how is? How can this guy be? I mean, that's just crazy. I mean, 30 years ago, nobody would have questioned anything. That would have been no. a scoop. They would have been like, oh, my God, he's got access. Uh, I mean, that's great. And, of course, I want to see what 
Putin says, you know, five years ago or so, Putin wrote an op-ed in the New York Times. They I published remember it. that, yeah. And he made a lot of sense. I mean, if you actually yeah. listen to the experts, the foreign policy experts, the people that are not the neocons, not the folks with an agenda, um, they'll tell you that, that Putin said, this is what I'm going to do. Um, I mean, you know, remember the promise was to Gorbachev under Bush 1. Ju- uh, Matt no Mark. NATO, man. Yeah, that's right. We will not, if you let East... In West Germany, a reunified Germany, uh, uh, reunify under the auspices of NATO. We will not expand NATO one inch further east. That's right. And and that's what Ray McGovern said, who was the head of the Soviet desk uh, and who was the Daily White House intel briefer to Bush one. Uh, and he got that directly from John Matlock, the U.S. ambassador to Moscow. And, and we promised that to Gorbachev. And then since then, 14 more countries we've taken in. And, uh, and, and now, now Sweden and Finland. Um, so maybe it's 16 now. And, uh, yeah, so we went back on that. Now we're trying to do it to, to Ukraine. We tried to do it in Georgia a few years ago. Remember that? Yep. Under Bush, too? And Putin sent the troops to, uh, into uh, Abkhazia, no, South Ossetia. Right. And, uh, and basically blew up the airstrips that the Israelis were, for some reason, preparing for, you know, long-distance takeoffs. And uh, we, we couldn't logistically do anything about it. And so we got out. Who wins in November, and then what's the first step towards solving this conflict abroad? Well, it, and it, immigration. Uh, I I think in a fair election, Trump will win. Uh, big, uh, I would think big. Um, and but Tucker has pointed out, you know, they've tried everything else before. You know, he came down the escalator, the Russia hoax. It's been one thing after another. The deep state establishment does not want him in because they're afraid party's over, payback. You know, a lot of what they've done is treason. I mean, remember Nixon, you know, no, nobody's above the law, even the president of the United States. Well, now there's an entire political class that's above the law. I mean, the Clintons raised over a billion dollars. You know, corruption is now endemic. Uh, they've gotten away with it. I don't know if we can ever get back to holding people accountable, but I would think a President Trump would be the first step. And, of course, the left is saying they're projecting. You know, they call it projection. They're doing all the things they're accused him of doing. They're the ones who are assaulting democracy or the Democratic Republic. They're the ones who are using lawfare. I mean, it's it's amazing what they're doing. They they tried a ministry of truth under Biden. It blew up in their faces, and they backed off on it because it wasn't working. Are we ever going to, though, see any any change at a macro level if all we have are these parties going back to each other and trying to dole out if we retribution? Do, if we do, it may come from the states because what we're seeing right now is a movement for, you know, California exit, Texit, um, states trying to reassert their, their autonomy, and they can do it by nullification, just sort of like mm, ignoring the federal government. There's a lot of lawsuits where they're going after the federal government. And it may be that some level of balance is restored under federalism if the states are allowed the autonomy that they were supposed to have under the Constitution and especially the Ninth and Tenth Amendments. So this new immigration bill from two nights ago, it passed, right, by a very no, narrow margin? No, no, it did not, it it did not pass. It because no, of the it got dead on arrival, um, and it's not going anywhere. But that was a scam, okay? It was. Why? So why were the contents of that bill not made more public um well first of all any bill when they have them now they're so lengthy that even yeah. the people who vote on it don't read pages. yeah they don't read it um but the argument that i heard that made the most sense was that all the tools the president needs are already there uh you know that that when trump left office it was the, the problem was largely under control and then biden basically undid everything and so all those tools are still there, executive orders, legislation, remain in Mexico, that we could deal with this issue. The only reason to come up with a bill, and they were tying it to more, yet more foreign aid for Israel and Ukraine, um, was to give Biden a, a, a victory to say, see, this is why we, you know, the Republicans, weren't able to do anything. Yeah, he's already able to, to, to deal with the problem if he's willing or if his masters are willing. to. The states' him. rights thing, though, I think people don't understand how autonomous states really are. That's right. um, how powerful governors really are in the United States and in the original of Constitution. I'm, I'm not sure which amendment it is. It's the direct election. Uh, 1913 was a bad era in this country. That's when we created the Federal Reserve and we went to direct election of senators. Um, 
as popular vote because originally senators were appointed by the state legislature. And so that was the ultimate check states had on the federal government. They could, you know, the senator from Nebraska could call a senator from Texas and Oklahoma and say, hey, they're trying to get an unfunded mandate. The hell with that. We're going to, you know, unify and say no. And that would stop it. And, uh, and, and of course, 17th amendment, 1913. But what about, uh, how do you feel about, uh, uh, sorry, FEC versus citizens United citizens United. Yeah. I've got mixed, uh, mixed feelings on that. I know, uh, Robert Kennedy jr. Has come out and he, he's got a, a podcast where he blames, uh, the corruption that we now have on citizens United. Um, I would my problem, that. what's that? I, I agree with that as well. I, I, I think we could get to the same place if we had full disclosure. Uh, in other words, if somebody is a Zionist and they're given a billion dollars to influence an election, that should be public uh, information. And the Foreign Agent Registration Act, FARA, should be applied. And there's, that's supposed to be one of, the, you know, one of the theories behind the Kennedy assassination was that he had ordered Bobby Kennedy to start applying FARA to the Israel lobby. And 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 if Farah did apply, you know, would we have gone into Iraq if you had pulled out that uh, registration uh, list and seen that, uh, you know, Wolf, Paul Wolfowitz was on there, Douglas Fife was on there, you know, Rumsfeld and Cheney both signed the PNAC uh, agreement. You know, they had signatories on there. It was William Bennett, Kenneth Edelman. It was uh, Jeb Bush. I mean, if you had seen those names on there, then maybe somebody would have been uh, asking, hey, wait a minute, are we going in there because these lobbyists want us to or is it good for America? Um, Citizens United, the problem is everybody has the right to vote, uh, but some people have money and want to contribute to influence it. So, And if money is speech... And, and some people will volunteer, okay? All right, if you want to go out and knock on doors, you're free to do that. And so... And you can also send in your, you know, minimum whatever. But another person may have their time is more valuably spent running their business and then donating, you know, to the candidates of their choice or to the pack of their choice. Um, and they vote. So I don't know. I think speech, I think money is a form of speech as long as it's there's full disclosure, transparency. So full foreigner. disclosure, not contribution limits or campaign yeah the, the problem with the ca- contribution limits is it's like squeezing a balloon every time they tie try that it pops up somewhere else so if you put a limit here then they set up a pack and then they give a you know 10 million dollars to the pack right but with full transparency and a cap yes each each candidate can have one million dollars yes i just saw a great podcast with will kane sherman's own will yeah. kane and he had Matt Taibbi, and Matt Taibbi is a real journalist, like Glenn Rolling Greenwald, Stone. like Seymour Hirsch, yeah. okay? He's an honest guy. He's liberal, but he's honest. And <clears throat> it was fascinating because I hadn't even heard of this group. In 2019, a new group was created called the Transition Integrity Project. And, they, and Taibbi was talking about how, well, there's about 100 people that are involved in this, and we, uh, we don't know ma- very many names. And there are only four names he mentioned that they did know about because they leaked out was Donna Brazil, John Podesta. These are two of the very highest operatives on the Democrat side. Bill Crystal. And David Frum, David Frum, I don't think even thinks he's American. He's a Canadian uh, Zio Nazi, basically. Um, and so him and Crystal. So what that told me that those are the four names. In other words, this is the establishment deep state effort, and they tried mightily to stop Trump in 2020, and this group is still at it. And Matt Taibbi was discussing it with Will Kane, and that certainly bears more uh, investigation because that is, I mean. If that's not the deep state establishment, I don't know what is. If you were a Democrat, would you be super frustrated by the way that party is run? Where, oh, absolutely. I mean, who's going to be the Democratic Look, Tulsi nominee? Tulsi Gabbard left the party. Yeah. Uh, Robert Kennedy Jr. left the party. It's because uh, you know, JFK couldn't get elected today. I mean, you know, it's, 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 it's not the Democratic Party anymore. It's not uh, the classic liberal. What happens to it's, the rest of us who are not 
Republicans and who are not Democrats and who go. have differing views. The problem views. is we only have two choices. This is a, a an inherent problem. The parliamentary system, it's easy for a third party to, yeah. to pop up. and then. But, you know, we've had more than two parties from the beginning in this country. You had What's the Federalists and the to... Anti-Federalists, and then you had the Democratic Republicans, and then the Republican Party comes along in the 1850s. But what's happened historically in our country is the new parties – more popular ideas get absorbed by one of the two existing parties. And then that party goes away, yeah. whether it's Bull Moose under you know Teddy Roosevelt. Right. And so we still get left with two main parties. So we need uh, to break through, to have, a, to have an independent, someone who's not one of those two, to br- have them break through. We need... It's going to have to be somebody who is next level charismatic. Well, and that's you could make an argument that that was Trump. Okay, I mean, remember Ross Perot ran and basically got Bill Clinton elected. Yeah. Okay. Um, so does it tilt the election? Because um, we do then get left with the lesser, lesser of, of two, two evils. evils. That's right. And so Trump and 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 this is what's where the media comes in because so many people we know that hate Trump also agree that there's. That the, that the system is rigged, that it's corrupt, that nothing changes because there's a uniparty system, but they nevertheless hate Trump. And it's because they've been told to hate Trump through the uh, manipulated media. But Trump, Trump represents the one guy in the last 50 years who's come along who really is an outsider. He didn't previously own any, or hold any elective office. Uh, he was targeted from the get-go. I mean, both parties were like, you know, who is this guy? And he broke through that glass ceiling in part because he's a billionaire, in part because he had some support from deep-pocketed people, but but also in part because the guy is so charismatic and such a hound for publicity. They estimated he got several billion dollars full of free publicity. You know, remember John, uh, Scarborough and— yeah. Mika Brzezinski, they'd have them on there all the time. Of course, now they're trying to counter that with uh, Rachel Maddow and, you know, the, the far left uh, just not covering his speeches. Just Let's just ignore him. Uh, we're not going to show you what he said. They're afraid that if people hear what he says, um, people will go, hey, that makes sense. In fact, I put that on, I posted that on Facebook. He's, there was an article, seven things that he's promised to do. Number five was, he said, we're on the verge of World War III, that we've got warmongers throughout the Pentagon and the State Department and in Congress, and he's going to you know, fire those people and he's going to expose them. Yeah, okay? we're talking war hawks. I mean. Yes, yes. And so who wouldn't want to hear that message? What real Democrat wouldn't want to hear that message? Well, they don't let you he- even know that he said that. That's what the censorship's all about. That's what MSNBC is can all I, about. Can I clarify something? You've been sure. referring to the far left, and then you said Rachel Maddow. Yes. Um, so I always say this. Establishment Democrats and Republicans are the same, except establishment Democrats pretend they like gay people. That's what I say. <laughs> um, so when you say far left, you're talking about American political party Left. Talk about Marxists, socialists. Okay, well, I would not. You're, you're, I don't know how familiar you are with Marxism, but Rachel Maddow, but no politician you're mentioning is a far left. No uh, Jewish uh, cabal leader you're mentioning is a Marxist. I, they're I would all say, capitalists. I would say they're very close to being Marxist. That they there's are, a lot they of. Are, uh, they neoliberal melt. capitalists. They're American imperialists. Well, you've I mean. got people who may be a media mogul, have lots and lots of money. Uh, and, uh, I mean, for instance, uh, Jeffrey Epstein, okay, the biggest contributor to Jeffrey Epstein, you know, he had no means of support other than Leslie Wexner giving him $400 million or more and other oligarchs giving him money for the cause. They pool their resources. I would say that they're willing to even crash their own company and jeopardize their own fortunes if it leads to the new world order that they're after. And I don't think the Rachel Maddows even get hired in the first place unless they are of uh, sufficient left-wing politics a, to get the job. It's very, it's an interesting analysis, but Marxism is the opposite of that. It's the bottom-up approach of the worker. It's, it's not a one-world government. It's not a state. I think I Judeo-Marxism mean, is redundant. Karl Marx was Jewish. Oh, okay, I see what I I see what's okay. Yeah, if the I mean, so if if the objective the Trotsky, the Bolsheviks, they were they were communists, but they were Jewish. Well, the the objective is to have 
is to have a class system again. Well, somebody in any system, somebody's got to be in charge and run it. Right. And of course, in the old Soviet Union, they you know the, they got to join the Communist Party and shop at the gum de, you know department stores, and everybody else you know go to their dacha, uh, you know by the Black Sea. But then all the peons, you know, lived like crap, getting in lines to buy toilet paper. Yeah, and then getting conscripted into. The military and going and fighting wars right. that the oligarchs decide we're going to go fight this one for this reason that we tell everyone, but it's really we're going to go we're going to go take these resources. I guess we're are y'all go... talking about like like there's Marxism, there's Marxist Leninism, there's Maoism. Are you talking about the postmodern neo Marxist? Well, they all have something in common, and that is large government control. With, without checks and balances, okay, as opposed to individual of the freedom, all right, freedom of the individual, okay. I think that's a large misconception, and that's a manufactured um, idea of Marxism. Uh, there are different. Don't you think it's left, the angle left, from which you look at Marxism, so well, Hill? There's a question left. of degree. Far left is very close to libertarian. Libertarians were. Oh, there. see, I don't, I don't, because I, I consider myself a libertarian, and um, I don't. And, and le whether you're far left or far freedom, right, you believe in using the government to achieve your goal. Um, sure. I mean, we can get to this. Uh, like the political spectrum the, is circular, not linear. Right. It's a horseshoe, right? So, I I agree with you there. Um, when it comes down to it, libertarians and Marxists both want individual liberty a marxist leninist might say you have to use the government in some way to, to achieve uh, that achieve that yeah uh accelerationist on both sides libertarians or marxists may say you don't use the government and you just get there but uh it's way more nuanced than does marxism work as a marxist well does That's marxism work without major government involvement because the libertarian would say that libertarianism is all about limiting government Does libertarianism work without like how is it all tribunals of courts it, and uh, it works in the united states to... throughout the 1800s so so who monopolized violence then well and i think that the, that one part of, of what causes confusion so hills uh very well read on this mm -hmm. is uh people like to put together the belief within the the best economy system Right. So so Hill, you do not like the term Marxist communist. Um, I th I'm a I'm a capitalist libertarian, probably more independent government protect our shores and our borders. I don't even think the government should deliver our mail for 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 crying out loud. Except that's in the Constitution. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but the, don't you think? Mail. Come don't, on, USPS, just no, on. no, absolutely not. That's how Amazon got kickstarted up to where they are now. But don't you think so, Hill? Because you and I have discussed this. So you can't, you have a problem when people pair Marxism no, with I communism. Uh, not at all. But that's very similar Someone to the way blur people. blur my face because I'm not trying to get McCarthy. But no, I don't mind <laughs> Marxist communism. Why is everybody so afraid of what well, everybody else well, thinks about? Well, a lot of people say that I'm just Marxism, joking. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> that, that the Soviet model just was imperfectly tried out. That next time it'll be better. Yeah, next time around. But the, the next the experiment. problem is once you empower a centralized government, the results are always the same. We are at, w Marxism is an economic structure of a society when it comes down to it. It's workers owning the means of production. We can apply any lens we want to, but uh, whenever, whenever we're talking about the failures of Marxism, how about the failures of capitalism? Uh, it's normally a projection. Well, if you that. ever hear Milton Friedman, you know, he talks about, I think is uh, um, he talks about, can you name me a system that's not based on greed? That capitalism is based on greed, yes, like all systems, but um, it, it's in your interest to go out and be successful, and then you're in a position to hire other people, and then those people prosper too. And you make the most because it's your company. But, but you, you know, still you... have the incentive to pay them as little as possible for working them as well, hard of course you do. as long the, the as possible. Bar, that, that's and a market force opposite. that sets your wage rather than the government saying, here's a minimum wage of $15 an hour. Then people are free to move. And with states having the autonomy they're supposed to have, you can go out and set up your own farm in you know, Wyoming if you want. You go up and be, get on a ship tall ship in massachusetts or or you can go fight indians on the frontier whatever you want to do 
Um, that's up to you. But the government shouldn't be the one that sets the wages. And then, of course, we have a, a, the common law, too, that where you can sue. And Ron Paul would tell you that. You know, what, what happens is that you got an oil plant in, in Ohio, let's say it burns coal. It burns coal, and that pollution then drifts into Pennsylvania. Okay, so what the federal government solution is, you set up an EPA or whatever, and then they get this revolving door bureaucracy where the, you know, the, the coal company executive goes to work for the feds, then he leaves the federal agency and goes back to the private sector, and they set up a minimum schedule for them to pay fines, whereas Ron Paul says access to the courts is what matters, because now you get the folks in western Pennsylvania can go sue the coal plant in, in Ohio, and they get a billion-dollar judgment, and all those coal plants in Ohio figure out pretty quick, we better put scrubbers on our smokestacks. we got to clean this air up, otherwise we're going to get another judgment against us. And you're saying that the access to the court system is a byproduct and an upshot of capitalism, because everybody's got it. Yes, yes. Whereas in Marxism— yeah, Access to the court system, that's your remedy. Whereas so, in your Marxism, opinion— Marxism, the court—sorry, go ahead. In your opinion, Marxism limits that, because it's the government— from the top down saying that you will not you will not pay the labor less than this. The well, labor will own this amount of your company. Yeah, I well, would, that's minimum wage, too, and that, we've well, done that now. See, the thing is, we agree so hard it's a horseshoe that, that that's not what it is. It is democratization of a workplace. It is bottom up. It's not top down. Isn't that, though, what capitalism ends up Hell doing no. when... Uh, the labor actually realizes how powerful they well, are. Well, they have profit but, sharing. You're talking about Marxism, Jess. They have profit sharing, and there are employee-run companies. Unions. You know, exactly. Stock options. And you, those are solutions that are not uh, that are not totalitarian in nature. No, those are capitalist solutions. Um, and, and the labor movement. Those are capitalist solutions to the degree that the labor got together and said, without us, tomorrow, no cars come off this line. Y'all pay us more or yeah, we're I mean, standing that's a out. Market, market lens of how So to what's do it. wrong with the market dictating then? Because if, if the levels are set artificially and the market doesn't dictate, that's not sustainable. If we say you have to pay people 25 bucks an hour minimum wage, nobody's going to go to McDonald's Agreed, anymore because they can't buy that burger for $8. There is legislation that literally doesn't allow labor union, labor organization. Well, yeah, in Texas right you can't have state. labor unions. Talking, yeah, right yeah. to work state. Rand Paul's big on that. Um, the idea that you are free to sell your labor to whoever you want to sell it to, um, but you don't have to join a union and then pay part of your wages to the union dues. Um, you should still be able to not join that union and, and go flip burgers at McDonald's if that's what you want to do. Yeah. I mean, that's a whole, uh, you sure. But there, there's also that that's where the holes come in with the cat. Like the, does there not need to be protections against the workers, whether it be through the market forces of capitalism and what you're saying, or well, heaven forbid, the government. Well, there, there are protection this. for workers in that you've, we now have OSHA. Uh, you know, we have government agencies that are supposed. Again, though, you get back to that example with the Ohio coal plant. Uh, you know, you get a revolving door of people running these. Yeah, things. ultimately, government agencies are still being. It's the same issue we're talking about with funding for Israel. Okay, so, so just there. just boil Marxism and capitalism down by just this criteria, then, and tell me which is better. Do we have the same level of innovation in Marxism that we see in capitalism? I don't Absolutely. know. Really. Because yes. the labor is all happy? Yeah, I would say you get none. Because there's no competition. In fact, it, it's the, isn't that what Churchill like said, that yes. uh, democracy or capitalism is the worst except for all the others? Right. I mean, there are there's always a downside no matter what system No, so, Hill, how would that work, though? Is what? it just that out of the goodness of their heart, innovation comes because there's much more contentment with their standing in their state of being no, because they're making more so, money? So the, the way to distill this conversation down is a, is, is a way to like straw man this or get to your conclusion that you want. But there's no one way Marxism is enacted. Marxism is a way of analyzing history, right? It's a way of, of looking at history as people are born into material conditions that they haven't cho chosen, right? And that the relationship between worker and, and capitalist, worker and boss, changes over time. How that changes, I can give you my solution. I could say that innovation 
theoretically, if we band together as workers and own the means of production, then th there still will be competition between my company and your company. That's one way. There's another way of saying, hey, if you get to a point of uh, redistributing resources for everyone to have their needs covered, then they are going to innovate based on from each Based according to his means to each according to his needs. Yeah, that's my problem. And I guess I see it just from a pure competition. Uh, the, and I you understand know, that. That's how we all have been brought up to see it. Well, I, I mean, see it every day, like in real this, life. This is though. a very recent human uh, framework of how, how society works. I guess I just look at it this way. Uh, much like my uh, views of abortion. If I was a woman... And I got pregnant and it was not something I planned on. It's my body. I can do whatever I want with it. You do not tell me what to do with it. If I was a woman, I would be screaming that from the mountaintops. Don't tell me what to drink, what to eat, what to do. I agree. Get away from me. I agree. And it's interesting that, and of course, the Democrats are focusing on that issue as a hot button issue to peel off women to keep make sure they continue to right. support Democrats. And that would get some moderate Republicans maybe to consider that too. Oh, yeah. It's almost as if the Republicans have such a strong hand, they want to even things out by screwing something up, by making the abortion issue so front and center. I say the abor I give the ab abortion example to say then if I wake up every day and I know it doesn't matter how hard I work, how early I get up, how much I innovate, how ahead of the game I am to put my competition out of business or put my team ahead of the competition just because the ground's level at the foot of the cross and you're not going to get any further than this. But if you do get this far, it's going to be an OK life. You know, you're going to go from gruel to like what? I don't know. You get a couple of you get a couple apples or whatever. That that wouldn't fly for me at all. I wouldn't be able to wake up every day and go, no. "This is great." I would be I would be very dissatisfied. You. And I, I or your agree. Family. And a lot of people who would consider themselves Marxists would agree with you, Jess. It's not it's not mutually exclusive. It is a a lot of uh, deprogramming and propagandizing that comes to how we talk about and frame these two structures of economic so what are you saying the ussr operated under what system i mean stalinism i wouldn't even say marxist leninism okay like, we, we, i took us uh one of my classes i took um they were talking about how collectivization on the farm um they let the peasants have a little plot of land that they could farm themselves on their own time and one of the things that developed in the Soviet Union was they would have shortfalls for the bushels of wheat or whatever they're supposed to be growing for the collective. But they had an unbelievably productive private plot. In other words, like 30 percent of the eggs that were supplied were from their little tiny chicken coop because all the workers had their own private worked their butts off to make sure that was successful and then didn't work so hard. Uh, on the collective farm. What do you do there? Where's the breakdown there too, So Hill, especially from your rugged individualists who say, man, I work my tail off, but in a Marxist system, uh, the guy next to me doesn't have to carry as much water, but he gets to drink as much water. What yeah, do you, how, I mean, do you, how do you combat that? How do you argue that? I mean, that's the argument weird. is that everyone getting to drink water is mutually beneficial for everyone. I'm going to work hard. People are going to work hard. People don't work hard under capitalism. You're projecting a lot of issues that happen under capitalism onto this supposed Marxism. That uh, there head. are people who don't work hard in a capitalist system, yep. and there are people who do work hard in and the capitalist are, system, th and, and they get further under capitalism. Don't you do think you the like hard the workers in cap the? No, I don't think welfare. I don't think. Uh, listen, man, if you're able bodied, you should be productive every day. Yeah, if, if you, you know are not going to bail you out, then there goes your incentive. If you're to, not able bodied, it is not the job of the government to take care of that. Is the job of your private community, your churches, your friends, your neighbors, etc. Right. Except then, when the government encroaches and takes that power, so that the citizens then say, "Ooh, daddy, one more, please, Mister Government," they then take that away look, from the private sector. Look at all the, the homeless folks we have now. The ability to solve that problem has been taken away from Americans because the government says. 
says we're going to solve it, and it never fucking gets solved. We have you spent as much as $20 trillion since LBJ on his Great Society program, and we still have poverty. It was supposed to go away. In the words of Ed Crane, the former head of uh, the Cato Institute in Washington, he said, government doesn't solve problems. It services them. And that's exactly what it does. You have bureaucracies that grow the, up. The problem Well, you see the circle away. here, that's where right? where we all agree. This is... That's where we all agree. That's we talk wild. about little things like our education program, our health care program, poverty, uh, hunger, etc. How about we stop putting people in jail for bullshit exactly. crimes? The American imperialist government is not going to serve the behest. Of, they're not going to they're not incentivized to do Marxism. I don't know what like that. That makes no sense to me. They're incentivized to do neoliberalism, to do neocolonialism, to do imperialism. None of those things are Marxism. And the welfare state, uh, everything you're, you just listed, education, are arms of that state apparatus, which is a capitalist, imperialist state appar apparatus, always will be. Well, they I find the welfare they state, like gay people. They the welfare state seems to me to be something driven by the left to create a dependence on the government the that's not left, which necessary. Is, which is capitalists who say they like gay people, uh, Jess. <laughs> they but like sorry, gay people or they'll tolerate them and not say that sure. they're living in sin and they're going to put it on their church charter. No, we don't believe in this, blah, blah, blah. Okay, last thing. Yeah, I'm sorry to derail this. November just. election <laughs> is going to come down like it always does to one, one thing. You, they usually do. They're talking about all kinds. They want to see what catches fire. And then they all dial in on that. What do you think it's going to be? We got Ukraine. We got Israel. We got immigration. We got the economy in the toilet. But what did Powell say? I'm not touching rates for like six months, he said. So mortgage people are out of business. Realtors are out of business. Home inspectors are out of business. Nobody can sell well, or buy a house. Well, a lot of things could develop. Oh, um, the, the rates will come down in June. Well, yeah, I would, just in I would time. expect that. Then the economy will but seem like it's on its way back. we could also get into another war, and that may become mm. the, the, the issue. I don't know. Um, Nobody can see the future, but what do you... Okay, if the election was in two weeks, what's the what's the hot button right yeah, now? I, they're starting to say a lot. Of, I'm noticing a lot on the media. They're talking about how come, uh, because uh, since the economy is so great, how come Biden's not getting the credit for it? That's what I think you'll see from, from the left. The economy's uh, great, huh? That's what, yes. They keep saying that the huh. jobs report was much more. Uh, Rent is up, pay is down, jobless is jobless is under control because they. <laughs> but of course, the reasons behind it is they they take food yeah, and energy out. Yeah, inflation's under control, and every Monday. When I wake up, I have a 15 to 20 emails telling me that all these different types of construction materials that I buy every week are all more expensive. Yeah. Then I go out my door and I look down and I see oh. Gas is about the same as it was two weeks ago. QT. So this inflation is not it's not tied to fuel entirely. So what are we doing here? What's going on? Why is this happening? I think everything's manipulated. Yeah, and, and it's all intentional. Like you say, the interest rates will come down before the election. Yeah, in June they're going to lean on the on the on the Federal Reserve. Maybe end of April into May, so that then people can put their houses on the market when school's out sell their house over the summer, happy again, summer vacation, fuel goes down. We had a good time at Yosemite. Okay, yep. who am I voting for? Get rid I'm of happy the Federal again. Reserve. I agree with Ron Paul. Well, the Federal Reserve isn't even, isn't, it, it, it's isn't a private federal. bank. That's right. It's, it's a not even a federal bank. bank. You know if that, you haven't researched that, research the Federal Reserve. Do you know they had 100-year <laughs> bonds yes. in the 1800s? Yes. I mean, there was no such thing as inflation. No. People could project that far. No, and a, I don't know if you know who Dave Smith is. The problem with Dave Smith, he's a he's a comedian. He's on with Rogan all the time. He's okay. a great, he's a libertarian. He's great. He's very highly intelligent. Inflation is not natural. Inflation is not necessary. Inflation has just become this thing that we all accept, and it's complete BS. The other thing, crazy, Federal Reserve. Have you ever seen the stats on how much actual gold exists well i know i know that there is a huge speculation as to whether there's anything left in fort knox or how much is there uh, i know the germans so he'll sued this us how much it, gold it's on a i think a football field there's a graphic showing how much gold there's actual 
this is how many gold bars there are, and it's not that much. I wouldn't think so, but but I, I remember Fort Knox is empty. There's another one. Well, there's another thing I read. They were talking about on the gold market. It's like Sunday night and Monday morning or whatever, London and New York. And you see at the time markets are closed, that's when gold is dumped. So in other words, it looks like they're dumping gold to keep the price of gold from skyrocketing because historically gold should be a lot more than it is right now. Um, and of course, the Germans sued to get their gold back, and we reached a settlement with them that we could repatriate it over ten years, which would imply that we didn't have uh, it all to give them right away. Yeah, show the graphic above ground gold. It's like um, it looks like it's about half of a football field, and it's yeah, stacks so I'm, that I'm are like three different. or four feet tall. I'm getting different uh, answers, but it says all the gold that has ever been mined would cover a football pitch to the depth of one meter. Yeah. But then I'm also getting, you know, it's not much. There's not much. It's not much. The currency yeah. isn't backed by anything but air. That's right. That's right. But um, it's also that's why like what, Ran, or Ron Paul talks about a, a, a basket of precious metals, yes, platinum, gold, right. and silver. And, uh, and, and, uh, Precious stones as well, well, looping those in there to back as well. Okay. Although, as we that know, the good diamonds... That government, but that would be tough to horrible, market. Especially you're... because more than half the diamonds on the market right now are made in a lab. But no, but De Beers mixes can, them can all you, together. Can you tell the difference between no. them? No. Yeah. No, there's a fascinating uh, documentary and, and, and out on Prime about that. Yes. Jewish South Africans. Um, yeah, the Rothschilds. Right. The... Uh, what what are your thoughts then on as you as you look at what the the power banks have the fact there's no gold backing currency what are your thoughts on crypto what crypto does I, I, I think the a FCC big risk. going after Some XRP people yeah people think that crypto is really just a, a a step to digital currency that central banks want um, I don't, I mean I'm pretty conservative when it comes to that I I don't think anything's better than gold and silver. Maybe not, but the anonymity of crypto is yes. certainly very the attractive has to those of us who with, yes. do not appreciate right. the oversteps that the click government your, takes. Your computer and transfer it anywhere yes. you want it. It's yours. No one knows how much anybody owns. Yes, only I you mean, know what well, you own. At some point, the government will be trying to. Right. They, they probably Current, have a better currently idea. existent cryptocurrencies are not going to be used by central bank digital currencies, but blockchain technology definitely will, and it is right now. But India, China, like. It's happening. So they want to, yeah, they're, they're going to want to get rid of Bitcoin. Not and, Bitcoin. And Ethereum. Yeah, they're going to, yeah. Yeah. Because they can't control it. So how's the criminal law business? Busier than ever? Um, yeah, it's getting back to, getting pretty much back to normal. I mean, you know, COVID slowed everything down. Yeah. Um, it, it's, Why? Because people weren't out committing crimes or just because well, the no, courts they're, they're, got the behind? The courts are having their, you know, full dockets. Yeah. Um, things are continuing to deteriorate. Uh, I mean, I think the judiciary is continuing to ignore the Bill of Rights and their, the, the oath that they take to uphold the law. Um, especially, it really, really upsets me to see with this family violence. You know, it used to be, yeah. if you didn't get along with your spouse, you go to get a divorce. You go to go into family law courts. Now, uh, oh, anybody can claim. It's usually a woman complaining yep. the man. Of course, it happens in gay relationships it happens vice versa but typically a woman says okay they get drunk and he hit me they call the police the police arrest the guy and the judges all want to look like they're doing something about it so even though it's a misdemeanor even though it's a misdemeanor and the government has two years to file a criminal case on that they order immediately as a condition of your bond they'll say you can't go home until this case is disposed of you're not allowed to go home you can't contact your spouse or wife girlfriend you can't pick your kids up at school. You can't do any of that. The stuff you would have had to go to a family court before and get an injunction granted by the judge after hearing some of the evidence, they just do a blanket, uh, blanket prohibition of so you going, guilty going home. until yeah, proven absolutely innocent. Gu guilty until proven innocent. Um, I've got right now. I've got a situation where this woman, uh, the hus she called the police. Cops came out, and for whatever reason, um, they decided she was the likely perpetrator even though she had bruises all over her body they arrest her they did an emergency protective order which means she can't go home for 61 days so she has to go out and get a hotel it's you know a hundred bucks a night you know it's sixty one hundred dollars um you know who's got that kind of money sitting around not everybody obviously um so what do you do 
And, uh, and then, of course, the language that you can't contact your family member in a threatening or harassing manner has now morphed into you can't contact your family member at all. And um, so basically it's like the, the criminal court saying this marriage is over. So this, this client is leaning towards filing, filing for a divorce. Probably the only way she can get back in the house wow. is to go get a family district judge to say, okay, everything else is on hold. Is it more important now than ever if you're caught up in some sort of domestic situation or if you're a party to some sort of criminal happening or if you're pulled over and you've had a couple too many drinks, is it more important ever than, than ever right now to just say, listen, I just, I need my attorney here. Yeah. It always has been. Yeah. But is it more important now than ever? Um, I don't know is if that say more, uh, it's harder an over exaggeration rights. Uh, um, anyway, but it's, yeah. yeah, I mean, we, almost all the problems we have is cause we didn't stick to the script. Yeah. Okay. If we'd just done that. When people need uh, legal help from you, should they just call your office? Yeah, uh-huh. call my office. All right, and uh, we'll put your office number up, and people can find you on Facebook, Richard Warfield, and they can find you online, Richard Warfield. Yes, yes. Dallas attorney. Not hiding. The most connected man in DFW. Thank you, brother. <laughs> right. Good to have you on Thanks, again. Yes. Thanks a bunch. Thanks. Rich never disappoints. I hope you like that as much as I do. Man, sitting down with interesting people who are well-read, who have opinions that they've formed, who think for themselves, that's what the Jess Marshall Podcast is all about. We bend the knee to no man, indomitable, be a sovereign individual who lives an intentional, passionate life. I hope you like the Jess Marshall Podcast. I'm glad to be shooting these again. If you know somebody or if you are somebody who wants to come into the studio and sit down, no matter what your beliefs or viewpoints are, man, DM me at Jess from the Northwest on your socials. Uh, you can hit me on LinkedIn or Facebook as well. We'll talk to you in the next one. Hey, what's up? Thanks for checking out my videos here on the Jess Marshall YouTube channel. Be sure to subscribe for sure. Hit that bell. Press that button to watch the next video. If you got a question you have about any of the topics I bring up in the videos, drop a question below, and we'll be sure to get an answer back to you ASAP. See you on the next one.